Welcome to another edition of the Dogger Pass Podcast. This for UFC Fight Island 2, Figueredo versus Benavidez 2. Coming off the heels of Fight Island 1, Ige versus Qatar. Um, I lost quite a bit of money, but, you know, you win some, you lose some. The highs outweigh the lows. Uh, you know, Saturday's card, uh, UFC 251, was like the most money I'd ever made on a card in my life. So he gave a little bit back last week. Kind of warned people that we didn't love the card. And, um, you know, onwards and upwards. What we're going to try to do here, get right back on track. That's just the way that we roll here. Uh, Cody Saftik, not in studio this week. Wasn't able to make it in this week. And frankly... I'm not the biggest fan. I I don't tell people this much, but like, I don't love being on camera. Um, I'm a producer. I'm more of like a behind the scenes guy. I get on camera with my buddy Cody because, you know, because he's pretty good on camera and he enjoys being on camera. So when Cody's not in the studio, I just prefer to be on phone. How are you doing, Cody? Yeah, well, thanks for tossing me under the bus. Cody just loves being on camera. No, no, I, I, I prefer this. I and this is this nice, but I get people like watching YouTube videos as well as maybe having the uh, option to have the audio. By the way, man, I don't know how you got crushed that bad. We went seven and four on the Wednesday show. Al Hassan parlays. Key, yeah, no, no, that's exactly it, man. Key guys missed, and uh, we have to take, we have to own up to that. Mm-hmm. And uh, th- you know, that's that's the risky part. If you want to bet them all individually. You know, then you're spreading it out. One guy loses, it's okay. A couple other guys won. But definitely when you're going after parlays, like you need everybody to kind of come, at least your key guys to come together. And yeah, some, uh, I wouldn't say bad bounces just because, like in hindsight, yeah, I mean, the writing's on the wall. Al Hassan's got one rep. He's either going to knock you out or he's not. That guy turned out, Muniz, god damn, he can take a hell of a punch. Things you learn after the fact. But yeah. In the game, Paul, you can never talk about after the fact. You just got to keep moving. And, uh, yeah, we got another offering, so let's just get right back at it. Yeah, I really should have just jammed. Like, once I saw Munir just take a bunch of those strikes, I should have just jammed a whole bunch and just kind of hedged out of the spot. But, yeah, live and learn. Let's move on. We got uh, Davison Figueredo taking on Joseph Benavidez, uh, second time that these guys fought. Davis and Figueredo, a minus 210 favorite this time. Benavidez, plus 175. These guys were supposed to fight. Uh, sorry, Figueredo should have the belt um, after their previous matchup, but obviously he missed weight, and it's a vacant, vacated title from Henry Cejudo. Uh, first fight, round one, pretty competitive. Round two, there's a bit of a clash of heads, and then Benavidez gets toast. Uh, we were on Benavidez last time. After seeing the results, I mean, the line that I'm drawn to again is Joseph Benavidez. I don't think I have the the the, the gall to uh, to pull the trigger on him again, though. He may, you know, he's getting up there in age and it's in a division like flyweight where speed matters, speed kills. I don't think he can really take down Davison. I mean, I yeah, it's just it's just really hard hard for me to trust him at this point. So. It's the main event, but I don't have any interest in betting it this week. What about you? Yeah, so first and foremost, going into the first fight, I'm on Joby Wan Kenobi. It just feels like it's his time, man. This is a guy that's perennially been the second best flyweight in the world behind Demetrius Johnson. <clears throat> Finally, somebody other than Demetrius Johnson has the belt, and it's Henry Cejudo. And, geez, Joseph Benavidez, he's got the history with Henry. He's got a win over him. It just makes all too much sense. And he's got a quick little layover against David Figueredo. This is going to be for the interim title. All of his dreams are finally coming true. 34 years old and it was like a leap year wasn't it like wasn't it the 29th february 29th like the fucking the fight took place on a day that happens once every four years or something so it's like everything's aligning for joby one i think joby one's got the wrestling advantage he's got good cardio david's Federato. who knows if he's even gonna make 125 which he didn't but god damn like ah he's he struggled with wrestling in the past so i'm on joby one okay in the first round i think Benavidez wins the fight. He's faster than him. He's landing the punches. Here's the issue. In that first round, he also gets stuffed out on his top couple takedown mm-hmm. attempts and stuffed out hard. And as someone who has Benavidez in the spot in that first fight, even though he wins that first round, you just knew it was a matter of time. Because Benavidez was hitting him two to one, sometimes three to one. He's hitting combinations and nice punches. But at no point did anything he land 
phase Davidson Figueredo in the slightest sense. No. Davidson Figueredo wanted him to keep throwing so he could counter him. He was inviting him to hit him so he could counter him. And in that second round, you just knew, fuck, this is not going well. But Benavides, he's crafty, and he's savvy, and he's still landing those punches. But you just get the sense that the running's on the wall. Now, Tan Dan fucked me here because the head clash should have been separate 100%. You need to separate them. And as Benavides is touching this cut, he gets bombed, goes down. That's it. Mm -hmm. I'm mad because Mergliata, it may be not a no contest, but at the very least, he needs to stop it right there. He needs to assess the cut. It would have given Benavidez a chance to at least, you know, clear the cobwebs, figure out what they're going to do. Maybe they go to the scorecards. Maybe the cut's so bad. Who knows? But you don't just allow it to happen. That obviously compromised him. I, I'm mad. But but now, you know, a week after, after the fact, and even then, it was just, you got the impression it was a matter of time. And now looking at this fight, I completely think, Joseph Benavidez could beat Davidson Figueredo in a three round fight mm -hmm. because I think as long as he stays away from the damage, he could do enough to secure two of the rounds. He could maybe, maybe not get him down, but at least hustle him down for a little bit, work him against the cage. A little, it's, 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 actually, that's a lie. You can't work this guy against the cage. He's just too big. But if you do get him down, you can hold him down for a little bit, you know, and guys have had success there before. Uh, striking, you are faster than him. You know, you're going to land some combinations. You got to stick and move. But the problem is in a five round fight is he's just playing with fire. And now Benavidez, 35 years old, and he's had, you know, he's had some damage in his career, whether it be the knee injuries. He's only been knocked out twice. But when you hear about the stories of him suffering those knockouts and, like, the, the post-concussion syndrome that he's, like, suffered, like, even just recently, you hear interviews where he's like, I really want to hurt Davidson Figueredo. I want him to wake up not knowing where he is, not knowing when his concussion's going on. I want him, and, and it's all very personal, man. It's all like that shit he's gone through mm -hmm. after the last fight. So now 35, I just don't see it. Figueredo, whether he makes weight or not, he's just too big. I'd like to say wait until you see weigh-ins because I don't want him coming in completely zapped because he knows he's got to make it this time. Yeah, we're and he's got one or two rounds of he's got one round of cardio or two rounds of cardio, and Benavidez breaks him down late and then has his way the way he should have had the first time. But I don't know, man. Based on how that one went the the first time, this one probably takes longer. Maybe it goes three, maybe it goes four. Benavidez works way too hard in there that eventually when it does get to start become a grimy fight, he just doesn't have the guns to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the gunslinger. And figure is a brick wall, man. He's not going anywhere. So the price is pretty good right now at 210. I would say Figueroa probably stops him inside the distance as well if you try to chase some additional money on like a TKO plus prop. plus 120 on off. plus 120 on the uh, on the TKO prop right now. Yeah, and, and I think with Benavidez, you think, oh, geez, you know what? Six pro losses. He's only ever been knocked out twice. And who are the guys that knocked him out? Demetrius Johnson was the only guy that knocked him out. Right, but now 35-year-old Joseph Benavidez, he just got knocked out again mm -hmm. by a big strong dude. And now he's fighting that exact same big, strong dude five months after kind of going on record and being like, I had a really bad concussion. He probably got two concussions in that fight. The head clash probably concussed him, splits his head right open, and then he fucking gets absolutely downed by a right cross. And then there's some follow-up ground and pound too, man. Like... He got fucked up. And now five months later, 35-year-old Joseph, ben, 35 -year -old Joseph Benavides is going to get out there and, and go to war? Like, I just can't trust it. And the price is not crazy right now. So I, I got to go with Figueredo. Yeah, I hear you. And the, the plus 120 TKO, probably probably not a bad bad path to go. I'm surprised it's still low. That should probably move. For the people listening, uh, we are recording this like late, late Thursday night. So... Weigh-ins are, if you're listening immediately, weigh-ins are about to happen um, just after release of this show. Um, so who knows where the lines will move. But yeah, plus 120, Davis and Figueredo by KO slash TKO. You don't, really need to, you don't really need the inside the distance. I would be very surprised if Joe B got got submit submitted. Unless it was like, yeah. unless it was I like, it. unless it was like a knockdown and he was like, kind of lost, and then there was just like a rear naked choke really, really fast when he was kind of stunned or something. But like, guillotine. that's this not... Guy's got a nasty guillotine. Yeah, that's such an on like, yeah, or, yeah. But Joe, Joe, Joe B's yeah. grappling is so good that I think, yeah, you can probably just take the, uh, the TKO prop if you want to get it a little bit more uh, spicy there. Let's move on to the co-main event. We have Kelvin Gastelum taking on Jack the Joker Hermanson. Straight pick him across the board right now. What's your take here? Man, this is the kind of fight that you kind of get flipping, flopping back and forth. And I see the lines kind of the same way. You see some love for Kelvin Gaslam. You see some some love for Jack Hermanson. I mean, see, ultimately, I think I'm basing it down on 
the same theory that I've had for the last number of years now. It's like Kelvin Gaslam is not a middleweight. It doesn't matter how much success he has against high-end middleweights. They know he was literally around for potentially becoming the UFC middleweight champion. But he's massively undersized. You can, you can only look away from that for so long. Five foot nine with a seventy-one inch reach is just is just not enough on on the on the bigger guys you're going to fight. Now I, I'll mind you, he's mixed it up with some credible guys. But the guys that were shot to bits: Ronaldo Jacare Souza, Michael Bisbing, Johnny Hendricks, Nate Marquardt, Jake Ellenberger. Those guys he rolls through. The guys that are actual contenders and they're actual sizable middleweights: Chris Wyman, Adesanya Till. He can put up a competitive fight with them. They are competitive fights. He's always in these fights. I'll give Gastelum one thing. He's got a granite chin on him. He's got a big old heart on him. But he just doesn't quite do enough. He's not throwing enough. His wrestling's pretty in- ineffective fighting big middleweights. And-, and it just feels like when he's in there, he just allows his opponent to just do a little bit more than him, just outpoint him a little bit more. Weidman fight aside, because he gets taken down like six times in that fight, seven times, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the last two fights in particular. The Adesanya fight... Outside of those moments, those spots where he just turns it up and he lands the head kick, and he it's it's mostly just Adesanya leading the dance and Gaslam being comfortable with it. Going into the fifth round, all momentum's on his side, and yet he got fucking killed in that fifth round bad. It's like, okay, fine. The Darren Till fight. Now he's coming into the Till fight. Every a lot of people are backing him. He's a 225 favorite over Darren Till. Geez, he can take Till down if he wants. Hey, talk about guys that don't throw pu- enough punches. Darren Till doesn't quite throw enough. But again, it's just he allows Till to lead the dance. He allows him to get off first. And in the end, even though it's a split decision, he lost the fight. It was a close enough fight. Don't get me wrong. But again, he lost the fight. The better punches were landed by Till. And and it is what it is. Now going in against Jack Hermanson, I got the feeling initially that's like Jack Hermanson's going to outstrike him. But Jack Hermanson's not a striker. And as much as he shows you again, it's it's glimpses. Some glimpses of some brilliance in there with Mm -hmm. the striking. But ultimately, he wants to get you down and he wants to grapple you. Absolutely. And there becomes the one thing with Kelvin Gaslam. A guy like Chris Wyman took him down. Absolutely. No problem. Mm -hmm. A guy like Chris Wyman now grapples him. Are we putting Jack Hermanson, who, by the way, was supposed to fight Chris Wyman, are we putting him on the same level? Does he have that kind of wrestling? Does he have that kind of top game pressure? Does he have that kind of submissions? I, I don't know. You know, his fight with Jacques Ray, where he took down Jacques Ray, no grapple Jacques Ray, that's a great indicator of this guy is operating on a world-class level. But the fight with Canyonier, it's like, as soon as he knows he can't get that fight to the ground, he knows, like, I can't strike with him pro- for a prolonged period of time. And, and even certain spots with Jack Hermanson, like the Jacques Ray fight, first two rounds, the guy looks like a million bucks. In the third round, oh, man, he's tired. He's he, It's falling apart. And then in the fourth round, he comes back and has a great fourth round, outpoints him in the fifth round. Like, that's a five-round fight. He demonstrates good cardio going the five rounds. But there's no doubt there's spots in the fight where he doesn't look great. Looking at his record, Talis Latis, Gerald Mearshard, Dave Branch, Jacques Ray, you know what all those guys have in common, Paul? They're all kind of like currently kind of around that mid to lower pack. They're on the, they're on the fringe of getting cut. I mean, Jacques Jacare won't get class. yeah, he won't get cut because he's you know a legend. He's Jacare, right? E- e- exactly. But like the other guys, you know, Talis Latest, thirty-seven. Dave Branch, you know, he's in his late thirties. Mirashar's not that old, but I mean, he was he, he, he was never a top twenty contender, even at when he's at his best. And they're all pretty much grapplers. <laughs> Cannonier presented that guy that's going to stuff your takedowns and outstrike you, and he kind of had his way with them. Like outside of Herm- Hermanson lands a lot more strikes in the first round, but the strikes are just, they're not, they're not hurting him. The bigger strikes are being landed by Cannonier. And then the second round and that uppercut just completely flat lines him out. Kelvin Gaslam, you know, if he's struggling to get those takedowns on Kelvin Gaslam and Gaslam should theoretically be able to outstrike him. But that becomes my problem. Like, I just don't think that Kelvin Gaslam throws enough punches. So again, as, as you can tell, I'm flip-flopping massively on this, but where I'm sitting currently at on this is I'm going Jack Hermanson. What finally allowed uh, caused me to say, you know what, it is a close fight. They got it 50-50. Hermanson's got the size. He's got the grappling. Uh, he's got the output. Gaslam's got the wrestling advantage. He's got the power. He's got a better chin. He's definitely the more durable. They've both got their advantages. The difference here is that Jack Hermanson was getting ready to take on Chris Weidman. Prepares for Chris Weidman. Puts in a full camp. Anything you check on him online, he's in great shape. I want Chris Weidman. This is a big fight for him. Coming off a loss, but a win over a former champion, a big name, puts me right back in there. Kelvin Gaslam, meanwhile, didn't have a fight coming up. Kelvin Gaslam tore his LCL back in January. He's been rehabbing yeah, for, for, for the last four or for the last five, six months. He had originally said, and this is going back to March, he originally said, I'm targeting a July return and I'd love to fight 
Jack Hermanson. That ended up being his wish. He's getting a July return against Jack Hermanson. But he wasn't putting in a full camp. He's mostly just rehabbing the knee. So he's actually taking this fight on basically three weeks' notice, whereas Hermanson, he's had like 14 or 16 weeks or something. So I, I got to think that Hermanson comes in good shape. He's a little bigger. Kelvin Gaslam's a little bit rusty because he's going to need a little bit of time to adjust to, you know, back in the octagon, baby back fighting, coming off an injury. Um and if if he is if he has a slow start and he kind of a slow start to begin with, Hermanson just gets up on points early and then ends up winning the decision in the end, maybe 29-28. So I'm flippy floppy on this one. I'm not super confident, but I'm gonna say Jack Hermanson gets a edges out a decision. Kelvin Gaslin's my only bet already on this card. I think that the grappling advantage is huge for him. Um Herman- Do you? Why why is that? Hermanson just being six foot one. I know that it worked for Chris Weidman. Uh, you know, somebody with a an actual pedigree, Hofstra, like decent uh NCAA uh wrestling a pedigree for him. Uh, you know, and a good a great, great uh black uh, black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I think it's just going to be a struggle for Hermanson to get underneath those hips, get secure those takedowns. Maybe he uses the size and just dominates him, holds him up against the cage, kind of pulls off like a Kamaru Usman type of a style fight here. I think on the feet, Kelvin's just a lot crisper, cleaner. Um, obviously, he's giving up a little bit of size, but he gives up a lot of size to everybody. This guy was, you know, going head-to-head with Israel Adesanya on the feet. I think if he can do that, he can definitely hang with Jack Hermanson up there. So it's a pick 'em fight, and I just think I just think Kelvin is a better overall fighter. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, live. Think- I'll live to to bet another day if I win or lose. But it's the only fu- it's the only bet on the card I actually have right now. So um, so yeah, a little bit of uh, disagreement on the first one. But you sounded a little bit uh, un- uneasy about your. Hermanson pick as it is. Right, right. And I, I think as far as jiu-jitsu goes, Hermanson's got better jiu-jitsu, but Kelvin Gaslam's a better wrestler. Mm-hmm. And as if, if, if it's as straight as Hermanson won't be able to get him down, then maybe I got a problem. But just just keep in mind, way back in the day, Kelvin Gaslam's always been a wrestler, but Uriah Hall, who just knew how to strike, took him down twice. Fair. Nico Musoke, that big, tall Swedish guy, took him down twice. Ellenberger, everyone thinks he wrestled collegially, didn't. Took him down once. Neil Magny, six times. Johnny Hendricks, obviously that was a given. Tim Kenny took him down three times. Chris Wyman took him down seven times. Jacques Ray took him down. Darren Till took him down. He does, and the Darren Till, he catches a kick and takes him down. But Jack Hermanson's great at catching kicks and converting them to takedowns. So I do think he's going to get Gaslam down. It's whether or not he can keep he's going to be able to hold him. Yeah, and, that, and that's a fucking problem on its own. Like, I don't know, man. I look up what he wants. He's a black belt. Gaslam is a black belt. But he's like by his own accord, he hasn't trained in a gi in years. Like, He's just, I don't think he's on Hermanson's level. I could be way off. It'd be a close fight. We're on opposite sides. It's a 50 50 fight. Well, we'll just have to see. How I'm not going to lie. You argue a good side. You look through Hermanson's record. And I know he's had some great wins and stuff, but like none of these wins are, in 2020, none of them are impressive to me. That is, that is very. Funny. Alex you're, Nicholson, you're not, Brad Scott, right. Talis Ladies. Yeah, is yeah. Talis Ladies like he's, is he dead? I think he's gone because he hasn't fought since like 2018. And I have. I mean, what is the guy's almost like forty now? He's got to be. Yeah, and not only that, if you remember that fight, Tyler Slade is like a hair is like a hair away from beating him. <laughs> yeah, and then fucking he like breaks his shoulder, and Hermanson just turns it on, pounds him out. Gerald, so Me- it's like oh, Gerald Mearshart, like he caught a bunch of people at the end of his career, and I don't think Kelvin Gastelum the, the LCL injury is is obviously a concern. Um, but yeah, it's a pick 'em fight. I just think Kelvin but Kelvin Gastelum's the better overall fighter. You know what? You're talking me into him. I'll, I'll have to have another look. We're one day removed from the other card. Um, but yeah, you know what? You, you're you're making very good points. That's the problem with this fight. Is you can argue both sides. So, all right, we got. We'll have to see. But you're right about KG. He's got youth on. Ah, he's got a lot of. Ah, fuck. See, I'm I'm getting my own. Uh oh. Uh oh. Maybe maybe I'm sapsticking you. Let's uh, move on. Go to, do it. Let's move on to the next one. We got your boys uh, taking on Mark Diacasey. Ra- uh, Raphael Fiziev is Cody's boy, or I don't know if uh, maybe you guys have broken up at this point. I'm not so sure. Uh, Diacasey minus 155. Uh, Fiziev is a plus 135. What's your take here? Yeah, no, Fiziev. Me and Fiziev no longer on the uh, the same page. Yeah, that 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 one's gone and died out. <laughs> Actually, I would say I would say Dia Casey is a lot closer to my boy. I mean, cashing that ticket against Joe Duffy plus one fifty, and then coming in and doing exactly what I need him to do against Lana Venata. Uh, it was easy to write this guy off. I mean, 
people are laughing at him. Oh man, he talks all this shit. He's got the red mohawk and he's a busted prospect. Like, bro, he lost a split to Drakkar Close, and which was a competitive fight, which he definitely did lost. Then he lost to Dan Hooker in Nazareth Hack for us. Mm-hmm. And we're shitting on this guy. Like, there's a lot to be given with Dia Casey. One thing really interesting about him is that we sit on this show. I guess I'm sitting on my bed right now, but normally we sit on the desk and we talk every fucking week about the benefits of being an American top team fighter. And in Dia Casey's case, it actually went the opposite way. He used to be a London shoot fighter guy. And you see him on the regional scene. He's explosive. He's got big power. He's got grappling. He's still a raw product, but he's developing. And he's an exciting little prospect. He comes to the UFC. He shows you that. You know, he goes on a three-fight winning streak right off the hop. I didn't think he looked no good against Frankie Perez. But, you know, it, it was a gut check performance. And in the third round, he did exactly what he had to do to get the win. The other wins, he flatlines a couple low-end guys in Sajewski and Paklin whatever he's a developing prospect but going to american top team i think that took away some of that like specialized attention that specialized training where you're not the big dick in the room now there's a lot of guys in this room who are top 10 world champions top 15 guys legends in this room all the time so i think it's hard to stand out and be that guy in the room going back to london shoe fires a smaller gym but a very big gym in europe it's kind of gotten him in a better place and you see the results i mean against joe duffy he shows you Still got the grappling, still got, you know, the, the explosive, and he's a strong guy. And, and the same thing against Lando Venata. Here's someone who's still young, he's still developing, but as long as they're not giving him terrible opponents, like, as long as he's not fighting top 15 guys, he should still be able to improve a little bit every time out, get a little bit better. Again, only 27 years old. He's got to, I'm not going to say he's never going to be a top, uh, maybe top 10, but he's never going to be a world champion. He's not going to be challenging for the title. But here's a guy that, if he develops the slow way, he's got a bright future ahead of him with lots of fights ahead of him. You just got to do it the right way. Um, Raphael Fizeev, these guys are, mind you, they're basically, the, the, they're the exact same age. There's like a month's difference in age or something. It's like he's more so just big dynamic with his striking, you know, big striking, big Muay Thai record. He used to just smoke guys, living in Thailand, killing guys there. He's one of the, uh, the, the he's the Muay Thai coach or the basically the head striking coach at Tiger Muay Thai. And the guy's just like dynamite, man. He hits you with spinning kicks, head kicks. You got it all. He's a big time finisher. Coming to the UFC, I'm touting him as, geez, you know, he's taking on Magomed Mustafaev. Been off a long time. Magomed Mustafaev doesn't usually go to his wrestling a whole lot. This is going to be a striker versus striker battle. And if it is, Fiziev's just a dynamite striker. I mean, what happens? He gets spinning back kicked. Square in the face. Goes down. Pounded out. Minute and a half. Embarrassing. Comes back to fight Alex White. I'm on him there again. But, I mean, everybody was on him in that spot. Be honest. I mean, kind of just skated by Alex White. It was an okay performance, but it was nothing. It was nothing overly big. Yeah. Against Dia Casey, I feel that even though Fizeev is a, he's got decent takedown defense. That's not his. That's not his foray. You know, he he's he's big on striking. Keep the fight standing. Keep the guy in front of you. Use that low kick. Strike with this guy. Dia Casey's longer than him. He's faster than him. And, and I just eventually think that he'll use the striking long enough to tie this guy up, get him to the ground yeah. at some point, and make it happen from there. So I, I'm not super confident in it. And of course, I'll watch a lot more tape on it. But the problem with Fizeev is that you're almost banking on he's just going to land that one big strike. Mm-hmm. Whereas Dia Casey has proven in all of his fights. I mean, Hooker hurt him. You know, he was hurt in the Dan Hooker fight, but he persevered. He fought on. Nazareth Hackcross. I mean, the guy's nasty. Got good striking. He persevered. He, he carried on. He's never been finished in his career. So I now can't bank on Fizeev might catch him with some crazy shit. It's like I don't know, man. This guy's shown to be durable. Better grappling. Decent cardio. He can go three, no problem. I think he's going to find a way to get it done. So I got to go with the bone crusher, Mark D. Casey, and uh, I'm going to lean towards decision. Yeah, I'm on board with that. Um, I, hopefully he does mix in some of the wrestling. I think the striking could be very, very competitive, but I, I believe that he should have an advantage. Should he t- take the decision to, or to, to ha- uh, sorry, should he uh, take the, the fight to the mat? So I'm on board with that. Well, D. Casey yeah, minus yeah. 155. What's what's up? He, well, I would say, even though he's kind of been, a, has decent striking, is that, yeah, you go through all of his fights. The Dracker close fight, three, he got he got two takedowns over the better wrestler, right? Um, but mainly, it's it's the Joe Duffy fight and the Lando Venata fight. He realizes now, geez, you know what? Why don't I just take these guys down? Joe Duffy, not a great wrestler, but neutralizes the boxing completely by taking him down three times. Lando Venata fight. Lando Venata wrestled collegiately. Lando Venata trains out of a gym that has a lot of good wrestlers in it, being Jackson Winklejohn. Uh, Lando Venata, no reason you should be taking him down four times mm-hmm. and c- absolutely controlling him on the ground. If you're taking down him and he's an adequate wrestler, 
then I'm really thinking he's got a great shot taking down Kazayev. If he yep. does, he should be able to get multiple takedowns and just grind this guy out, take that decision. That is the easiest path to victory for him. So let's hope he takes it because I'm sure I will end up with a little bit of Mark Casey when uh, Saturday comes. We got uh, Ariane Lipsky taking on Luana Carolina. Ari- Ariane Lipsky is minus 120 favorite. Uh, Carolina is plus 100. This fight's been uh, canceled and rebooked basically due to coronavirus for the last, uh, since May. Um, but they've, you know, they never disbanded the fight. They clearly want Ariane Lipsky to, you know, she's a very, very good looking girl. You know, you got Paige Van Zant probably on the way out the door. We need another, uh, we need another uh, marketable, marketable fighter here, so... I don't know if it's going to really work out for her. Tough little run for Ariane Lipsky. Uh, c- coming off of a win over Isabella de Padua. They finally found that win for her. But before that, Joanne Calderwood made it look pretty easy. Molly McCann made it look pretty easy. You know, the girl, uh, Ariane Lipsky, who was pretty exciting prospect coming into the UFC from KSW. It really hasn't panned out. Luana Carolina, on the other hand, I mean, her only win in the UFC is over over Pr- Priscilla Ketchup beating. We cashed the ticket on Luana Carolina because, I mean... When, Everybody cashed the ticket when it's Pris- against Ketchup beating. I mean, when it's, Pris- when it's Ketchup beating, you don't bet her. I mean, we. I think we, Shayna Dobson. We were like, okay, this is a pass. We didn't necessarily fade catch a beating, but there was no. I, I would never put money on her. Um, so yeah, you know, Air, uh, uh, Luana Carolina did what she had to do. She's pretty long. Strikes her. Or strikes pretty long. Maybe Lipsky can get inside, make this a little bit ugly. At range, she could be in a little bit of trouble. I suppose I lean towards Arion Lipsky here, but based on her track record, like I have no interest. I, I'm, I'm learning that with a lot of these uh, lower level women's MMA fights, man, like don't get overly invested financially because arm bars from guard are very alive and well. And there's nothing more tilting than being like, oh, th- this, this maneuver doesn't work anymore. Nobody gets caught in. Oh, no, I just lost my bet. Um, so... Yeah, I'm staying away from this completely. Most low-level women's MMA fights, it's just like, you know, at the, top of the, at the top of the bracket, the best of the best, you can really rely on them. But as you get to, like, the middling type of contenders in lower-level women's MMA, especially in the flyweight division, I mean, th- th- none, of these, none of these girls are really all that trustworthy. So it's a straight-up pass for me. What about you? Yeah, I want to believe in Lipsky so bad. I mean, here was a legitimate prospect coming over to the UFC. And I am say legitimate because it's like, there's the argument that she didn't fight great talent in KSW. But what I'm saying is fighting in KSW is fighting in the big show. It's fighting under the bright lights. It doesn't really get bigger than that. Even though UFC is a bigger brand name, I'm talking about arena size and crowd noise and people that they're packing into these places and the the the, the pie of like just like i don't know the fireworks that they're doing and the introductions like it really is the big stage and as far as these european fighters go a lot of them you know will be top european fighters and never get a chance to fight on the ksw show her being the champion her being promoted there and her just looking tremendous just smashing through whoever they put in front of her you really got a sense of like this is a very exciting prospect when the ufc signed her and i I don't know because i haven't seen any disclosed pay from her but i got to assume if she's leaving ksw where she's a budding star over there, very pretty girl who's their champion, who's just on a killer streak right now. If you're going to leave that behind to come to the UFC, it has to be made it worth your while. I'm assuming she got a decent amount of money, comes to the UFC, and the UFC is notorious for this. You want to get paid, that's fine, but you are going to earn it. And they give her Joanne Calderwood right off the hop. Not a great matchup for your first fight out. And then it, it gives you the, then you realize right then, it's like, okay, well, she's just not ready yet. She's young, she'll get better. Okay, perfect. Now she gets Molly McCann. And I know Molly McCann, you know, didn't really didn't look great last night. I don't know. Her opponent just looked phenomenal. Not that she didn't look bad. Her opponent just fucking looked awesome. But again, here's a bad fight for her because Molly McCann, you know, is a pressure fighter and she's always in your face and she's got good cardio. And in this case, she's getting taken down by her. Uh, it's a tough go. Finally, you get somebody, Isabella Dapua, who it's like, okay, 
She can beat Padua. She could she could finally get that first UFC victory. But the numbers are just shock. The fight itself is terrible. But she's taken down twice in that fight against and again somebody who is what shouldn't have been on that level. Mm-hmm. But here's the troubling part, right? Ariane Lipsky landed 22 strikes in the first round. It's good first round. In the second round, she landed six. In the third round, she landed three. She won all three rounds. A lot of people gave her 30-26 in some cases. It's like, geez, man, that was really low output. And that's the problem for me. She is a much more refined, much more polished striker than Luana Carolina. They're about the same age. I don't think it's one of these things like, oh, well, she's Lipsky's over the hill. She's a little bit older. It, 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 she is the better striker. The difference is Luana Carolina just throws down, man. And we don't have a we don't have a ton to go by because she's just so young in her career and she's fought in very low level. But the Dana White contender series fight against um, Mabelli Lima, my God, this girl just keeps throwing. She's got good cardio and she's got very high output. And then the Cachoeira fight. Yeah, listen, it's Cachoeira, and it's a low level, and I and I get all that. But you got to admit, it is still fairly impressive when you go out on basically any opponent and land 111 strikes. You mm-hmm. know, her submission game didn't look terrible. It wasn't like she's a fish out of water, one dimensional striker. She had some okay grappling. So, so Lipsky's not going to take her down. This is going to be a striker versus striker matchup. And even though Lipsky's better. My worry is, is that Carolina is just going to throw a fucking lot more mm-hmm. and just outpoint her. Now, Lipsky has that back class where she was a highly touted prospect, but she's done nothing to live up to that. And even though she's coming off a win and she's got that win, and it is a step down in competition. I can't get over the fact that to this point in her career, she has to be considered a bust. And a bust coming in, you know, the odds, the odds are relatively close, but Luana Carolina is the underdog. I expect Lipsky to get a little bit of money coming in on her because you're just more a popular fighter and trains at a big gym and has that hype. Like maybe you're going to get a better price on it. Listen, when the amount, when the fight is announced, I was on Lipsky, 100%. I'm on Lipsky because she I, she's a much better technical striker. This is going to be a striking battle. It's re-watching their body of work where it's like, it's not necessarily always who's best. It's who wants it more. And Carolina just, she just goes after it. She throws a lot more. So unless that's grossly negated by... Lipsky's clinch game or or so I don't even know I don't think Lipsky has a great clinch game I would have to say that you probably want to pass on this fight but my pick is going to be Luana Carolina I think she outpoints points her based on volume and then again picks up a decision we have Alexander Pantoja taking on Asker Askarov Pantoja minus 210 Askarov plus 175 what's your take here uh, this one might definitely bite me in the ass, but like Askar Askarov signs to the UFC, and I am all on the Askarov train, baby. This yeah. guy was ACB, just reckless, man. He's smoking guys, and his submission game is just on another level, man. I'm not talking rear naked chokes and guillotines, which he does have. I'm talking anaconda chokes. I'm talking wins by twister, like very scrappy. He's got a good gas tank on him. Uh, you know, hey, why can't this guy come to the UFC and be an immediate challenger? But he didn't look good against Brandon Moreno. Mind you, that's a very tough fight for a debuting fighter. And the UFC probably did the same thing to him. Gave him a good chunk of money. Come to the UFC. Got to fight somebody decent. Moreno's there. Moreno's just a, an excellent scrambler and has proven to be a very good fighter in his own right. But he didn't look great against Brandon Moreno. That's fair. Let's get him the Tim Elliott fight. Oh, my God. Did I sweat one out mm. during that Tim Elliott Especially, fight. yeah, round one until Tim Elliott. Holy Tim Elliott shit. round three. And this was Tim Elliott outside of glory mma and fitness he looked a little bit he looked quite a bit exactly. he looked quite a bit more composed and had it more together this past weekend for sure but yeah that was tim elliott charging forward hands down round three just giving just giving askarov round three it was great for my for my dude, wager oh dude absolutely because going into round three it's like oh man this is a close fight mm-hmm. and then by tim elliott's own account he's like i don't remember anything past midway through the second round yeah. he's like literally got through the second round and then went on autopilot but it's like again askarov maybe maybe you can just chalk it up to geez okay he's still young and he's still getting he's still developing and this is his first two fights in the ufc and they've given him brandon moreno uh, a, a young hot prospect who's fought in a lot of high level guys and is definitely on his way up and tim elliott a former world title challenger Fuck, this is a couple tough couple fights to come into the UFC. It's not getting any better here. I mean, Pantoja's got all the same problems. He's got a probably, you know, he's a very adequate striker. He's got good striking, something he's always improving on. And he's a very good grappler. So where's Askarov's path to victory here? Does he hustle him up standing? Like, I don't know. He might not be the superior striker. Was he going to take him down and out grapple him? Like, I don't know. I don't know even know that he's, he's the superior grappler. 
Like, well, where does he beat Pantoja then? So, he's just going to have to outwork him. And maybe it's possible. I do give him speed advantages. But I don't know. Without the finishing ability, it's just going to have to go, probably have to go three rounds and then beat him on the scorecard. And I feel like Alexander Pantoja just got a lot more ways to win. You know, he's the better striker. He's probably got the more well-rounded grappling game. And uh, and as far as the price tag goes on it, uh, minus 210, it's not a very good price tag. But I don't see Askarov going away. And for that reason, I would chase Pantoja on the uh, on the decision prop. Yep, I uh, I'm I'm on board with that as well. I think he's I think he's pretty underrated guy. Or pretty underrated guy. You know, he's a good prospect coming out of the Ultimate Fighter, and he lost to Figueredo, uh pretty pretty clearly across the board. Most people had a 30-27. Figueredo landing the you know the much more definitive, uh, more powerful strikes. But like you look at the stats for that fight and Panto, it was sixty-seven to sixty-one in terms of strikes. Um, in terms of takedowns, it was zero zero. Or sorry, uh, sorry, takedowns was two two. Like it was, it was yeah, it was a, it was a close fight between the two of them, and that's literally the champion. I know he didn't actually get the belt because he didn't make weight, but that's basically the champion of this division. Um, I think yeah, I think Pantoja he's got. Uh, 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 fantastic jujitsu. Obviously, got a little exposed a little bit earlier in his career against the scramble master Dustin Ortiz. But yeah, no, I think this is Pantoja's fight to win. So uh, give me him. Uh, moving on down, we've got Roman Dolidze, who's supposed to since April or four twenty. Uh, very nice of nine of uh, twenty nineteen. Uh, this guy's been trying to fight and he's had a whole bunch of fights cancel. This is like the fourth time that they've tried to book him. 6-0 fighter come, uh, fighting out of the Ukraine. He takes on Hadis Abrigo. I always mess him up. And I think after this one, I won't have to say his name again. But Hadis Ibragimov, who has coming off of losses to Da Ung Jung and Ed Herman last time out. Um, this Roman guy fights kind of nobodies, but it seems like he just ices fools on the regular. Uh, is that what's going to play out here against Hadis? Well, you know what? One could definitely make that assumption. Hadis has looked awful. And I want to take full, full responsibility on this. I pride myself on being able to, you see a guy, geez, this guy looks good. This guy's got, this guy moves well. You know, he's got high upside. His wrestling's good. He's got good jiu-jitsu. He's got good striking. On the regional level, how does that translate to the UFC? That's, well, that's why we're here to gauge it, you know? I thought Katie Sabragamov would be fucking good, man. He's a former M1 champ. I watched all of his fights in M1, had to work for Fight Network. This guy is fighting decent competition and, I mean, beating them and looking good. He comes to the UFC. It's like I'm tooting his train. He's a minus 275 favorite over Da, da Ung Jung. And for whatever reason, Paul, he goes and ex- dumps the entire clip in the first three minutes. I mean, goes hard. Goes as hard as a human being could possibly go. Exerts all of his energy. It was the world's worst game plan. Now against Ed Herman, it's like, hey, Ed Herman's old. Uh, you, you don't even have to fight at a big pace. Like he, he doesn't fight at a big pace himself. Just like slow it down this time. And he basically lost every single round to Ed Herman. He's so unbelievably untrustworthy at this point. Even though he's only 25 years old, it's probably a lie. He don't fucking look 25 to me. I'm hmm. sure they're lying about that. <laughs> and, and he doesn't seem to be getting any better. Like, in fact, he's regressing. He's regressing fast. This guy's from Dagestan, and he does not, he does not fight like your typical mold. If I like... What a letdown. What a letdown. Would you, per, perhaps, perhaps he just isn't able to use his vitamins when, uh, when uh, USADA's around. And he was able to use his vitamins when he was in uh, M1. Right. So it's funny. He doesn't, he doesn't like look actually. like it. He doesn't look like a guy who uses his vitamins. I know that. But, you know, there's different vitamins. Right, right. So anyways, that actually does bring me to my next point. So there's Roman Dolitz. Listen, I, I would bet pretty much anybody over Ibrahimov, based on his two UFC performances, holy shit, this guy does not have it. You could pretty much pick anybody in the division, and I think it's a safe say that they could they could very well beat him. Um, but now you have this very interesting guy in uh, in, in Roman Dolitz. So here's, here's the strange story on Dolitz, which at least gives you a little bit of pause for concern. 
But Delete's is he's signed to the UFC, like you're saying, uh, April, April, tw- or yeah, yeah. He's supposed to right? fight for 420, yeah, 2019. Right, so he's supposed to fight in 420. Anyways, he pulls out of the fight citing an injury, right? So now he's supposed to fight Vinicius Moreira two months later, right? So it's listed that he pulls out of that fight. Um, he pulls out of that fight again due to injury, but he actually got popped by Usada before he ever even fought in the UFC, right? So literally like a couple months after he signed with the promotion and they announced his official date, he got popped for couple things by the way he taught he, he tested positive for clomiphene it's metabolites m1 and m2 long-term metabolites this fucking word you'd never be able to pronounce uh for chloro a- anyways he tested positive for a bunch of shit this is the very very interesting part about this story okay after he tested positive for all that shit you saw the red flag but he's not fought in the ufc at this point mm-hmm. he's fought in ukraine and georgia and has fucking run through some guys so so keep in mind, when you watch this guy's highlight reel, it looks like he's on steroids. And then sure enough, the UFC signs him and he tests positive for steroids. Here's the interesting part here. Usada Red flags him and they call him and they're like, bam, just letting you know, you just tested positive for steroids. You got flagged for steroids. This guy is like, absolutely. I've been doing steroids the last five years. Here are all the steroids I do. This is essentially where I got them. Helps Usada. And they say he is so easy to work with and is so forthcoming with all of his prior steroid use, they give him a one-year suspension instead of a two-year suspension. So now his suspension's done. He's 32 years old, and he's making his UFC debut. And you know he's not on the juice now, or at least you would assume he's not on the or juice maybe, now. Maybe he's so high. I can't maybe. fucking trust this guy, maybe. Paul. He hasn't fought in two years, by the way. Fair. Like. Come on, man. Now, now, now one thing when, we, is, when we talk about DraftKings at the end, I think you're going to want to be involved in this one, though. Right, right, right. And so we're t- here to talk about more than fucking theories, and we're also here to give you a pick on every single fight. And so the pick is Dolitz. Even though I just think I would fade anybody against a Bragamov, um, this guy's actually a pretty credited grappler, right? So Fila used to have this world grappling championship. I know a bunch of Canadian guys that competed there. I know American guys that competed there. It was high end. You know, there was good guys competing at those Fila tournaments. He ended up winning uh, the gold medal in like 2013 or something was the, was the Fila gold medals. Beyond that, 2016, so this was three years later, he won the ADCC Asia and uh, Oceania, which is like uh, Australia, New Zealand, all that in with the Asia. He won the ADCC grappling tournament, which just gives you a buy to the ADCC tournament by winning it. That's high. That's high end, man. That's high enough end. So we know he's a juicer. If you look at his highlight reel, he can't wrestle for shit, but he is strong and he just rips you to the ground. He just pulls you to the ground at some point. And when he does have you on the ground, he is kind of a he's kind of a tough guy. Bragamov's just rolled over in every situation so far. So I would have to assume that, you know, if I'm going to give you a straight pick here, I, I would say that that Roman eventually just gets a hold of this guy, gets him to the ground. Even when he is throwing strikes, man, it's herky jerky, but he is throwing. Mm-hmm. The one thing I would say is that if Bragamov can just swing on you for three minutes, and we have no idea if Roman can take a punch or not. Quite literally, no one's really hit him. But Mikhail Pasternak, that's his last win. It was two years ago. That guy's no joke. You know, he's a former one FC or uh, one FC uh, light heavyweight title challenger, fought Hodrick Gracie. You know, the, the guy is no joke. That is a credible enough win. He also beat a decent enough guy, Brazilian fighter before that. I would have to say that he is the pick, but I don't know that he's like some guy that you want to invest heavily on or have a lot of faith in because he's got a shady backstory and you really don't know what kind of level he's going to operate now coming in off a two year layoff and being, you know, 32 years old. How good was he to begin with? A lot of question marks. Uh, for that one, we got um, fight doesn't go to decision minus 195. That's what I see. It's minus 227 in some other spots. That may be a half-decent parlay piece, especially, I mean, Hadis usually rolls over at some point, and this, and, and Dalidze just literally just, he either, like, he just finishes everybody that he fights, so... That could be an interesting one, especially if these the big boys start coming out, uh, coming out firing hot. But haven't made a play on that. But that's yeah. something that I'll consider as like rather than picking a side, maybe maybe like hitting an under or something like that in this fight. I don't know if I would do the under. Two, I, I would want it to be like an under two and a half, though, not an under one and a half. Uh, if I was going to go down that path, anyway, we got Grant Dawson taking on Nad Naramani. Grant Dawson is. A minus two fifty five favorite, Nad Naramani plus two fifteen. What's your take here? 
mean, Grant Dawson's my guy. It's so far, he, even his regional show career, even till now. Listen, the guy is young. He's, he's still green in his own ways. He's still developing. So he does get himself into tricky situations. Obviously, we all basically had a mini heart attack in his fight against Derek Minner last time out. Mm-hmm. But it's like, this is a guy that is just going so hard that, yes, there will be some slight mistakes here and there. Uh, he's going to slip up here and there. We get it. But but I don't know, man. I just feel like Grant Dawson is really making those improvements, getting better every time out. And this seems like a very winnable matchup for him, being that Nad Naramani, he's tough, he's rugged, he's a good wrestler, but you really got to see that there are levels to this. And in his case, I mean, he's bullied a lot of smaller men the majority of his his own career, you know? Patty Pimblett, just dead not physical enough to deal with a big, thick guy like Nad Naramani. Khalid Taha. Geez, the guy's a former flyweight. Mm-hmm. Anderson Dos Santos. You know, Anderson Dos Santos is a big enough guy. He's not mostly the phys- most physical guy out there. Mm-hmm. I got him picked over Mike Grundy. And Mike Grundy made it look pretty good. You know, he got a wrestling advantage over him. As soon as he couldn't get that takedown, because he started to get tired, he just bombed him with the right hand. And then Nad has now sat out, you know, uh, the better part of a year. I think it's like 15 months or something like that. Yeah, he had a, March, an injury pulled him out. March yeah. of 2019. He got hurt, pulled out of a fight with Nick Lentz. So now he's coming off 15-month layoff. He's 33 years old. So a lot of these guys will talk about the fact that, oh, you're 25, you've been off a couple of years. You're 27, you've been off a couple of years. That, that's okay. You're going to make improvements. You're in the gym. You're getting better. In Nad's case, I feel like what we saw last time out against Grundy was kind of his ceiling. That's kind of as high as he's going to get. And now beyond that, he's just there to give, you know, up-and-coming prospects and, and guys like – Grant Dawson, a tough fight. And I think it will be a tough enough fight. He's going to make Dawson work. But ultimately, Dawson's got the tools, I think, just to drag this guy out, get the fight that he wants, which is probably going to be a, a grappling affair where he can just tire Naramani out. And uh, and being, you know, Tim Elliott just got the win. They're all together on the island. Uh, James Krause is with them. It seems like Glory MMA and fitness. And listen, Tim Elliott and Cruz, he didn't look great. But that was a good fight for Tim Elliott, considering where the fuck he's been the last little bit, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I would say that there are positives to take out of it, and uh, and that Grant Dawson, even though he's minus two fifty five favorite, is a big favorite. He's one of the bigger favorites on the card. People are starting to get behind this kid. Uh, he looks good for a reason. He's uh, he's fifteen and one for a reason, and he's just continuously getting better every time out. He's still only twenty six years old. I, I feel like this is Dawson's time to shine, and then never mind, he's a tough enough opponent that it'll present a, a good little fight and a good builder for him. Yep. I like where your head's at there. I think Dan Naramani, especially when he has, yeah, when he doesn't really have grappling advantage over top uh, over his opponents, struggles mightily, and I don't think he has an advantage in grappling in this fight. Um, I was gonna, I was gonna take a shit on Team Alpha Male here, but it obviously looks with coronavirus that uh, Nad Naramani spent the time in Wales getting ready for this fight. Um, cause I was going to be like, Hey, has anybody from team alpha male looked good during quarantine? Cause I can't think of anybody. Yeah, I know. I hear what you're saying. I mean, we do like to shit on those guys and I guess Josh Emmett came out and did the dude yeah, like, true. by hurting his knee. But I mean, yeah, yeah sorry. Few then far between, right? I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll take the L on that one. Uh, forgetting about Josh Emmett who looked tremendous, but I mean, yeah, when I was thinking of like Andre Feely, he didn't look great. I don't know. Um, yeah, let's move on. We got Joe Duffy taking on Joel Alvarez. Joe Duffy minus 345 favorite. Alvarez plus 285. I think it's Joe Duffy's fight to lose. The only good stuff that I've really seen from Joel Alvarez is the grappling. And I don't see... Uh, Joe Joe is obviously competent enough in all facets of the game. This is a guy who is a super prospect coming into the organization has taken some pretty big L's. He de- definitely did not live up to the hype, you know, being the f- uh, the second person to beat Conor McGregor and the first one to beat Conor McGregor on, like, a, on a decent stage. But you go through and, I mean, yeah, he's losing to uh, Dustin Poirier, went to went the decision. Um, got knocked out by James Vick. Not exactly the best look. Losing to Dia Casey. Joel Everest is a massive step down from the guys that we are used to seeing Joe Duffy take on. Um, I don't love the minus 345, but I figure that's probably going to get closer to minus 500 by, five, by fight time. Uh, Joe Duffy is the pick. What about you? Yeah, listen, I like Joe Duffy. I think he's got the better skills. I think he's a more well-rounded fighter, and I think he should be able to get the victory. The one thing that I am struggling with is that Joe Duffy, just, he's not 
really trustable anymore. And, and I know the losses are the high-end guys, Dustin Poirier, James Vick, Mark Casey. Well, people will say, well, Dustin Poirier is high-end. Those other guys aren't. Listen, man, these are top 15 guys. You know, these are, these are top – these are top guys. These are, these, when you when you look at a Joel Alvarez, he fits the same mold as Resume Daddy, Mitch Clark, mm-hmm. Ivan George, Jake Lindsay. You know what they got all in common? They're not employed. With the oh, company. the librarian! I forgot about the librarian. What's yeah, what's so the I mean, librarian just, been up to recently? You know what? I'll give him one thing. He takes tough fights, like even now. But uh, yeah, he's kind of coming off a big win actually. I think he beat Dakota Carter or something stupid. Jesus, he's oh no, my god! This no, no, he's not. Look, but yeah, yeah. No, he's, he, he's still doing the damn thing. Oh yeah, he lost to David Michaud in uh, 2017. I don't know who a bunch of these guys he was taking on. I forgot about him though. The librarian that that takes me way back. This me scrolling through his record of all these regional scene stuff really is making me feel old right now. Yeah, and so this is where I don't want I don't want to get caught up in, in in Joe Duffy is that Joe Duffy beat Conor McGregor. That's that's his claim to fame. That's mm-hmm. his big thing. People don't remember that he actually tried out for the Ultimate Fighter season twelve and lost to Kyle Watson to get into the house. Mm-hmm. But we do remember that he beat Conor McGregor five months after that. That's his big moment of his career. But he rode that. I mean, think about it. This guy went and did pro boxing for three years. He gave up MMA in 2011. He was doing the pro boxing thing. And then when it turns out that didn't really pay all that much and I wasn't getting further ahead of that, Conor McGregor was already making it by that point. It now became more lucrative for me to go back to MMA and just bank on the fact that I beat Conor. I'm going to get a rematch of Conor. So they sign him and they give him Jake Lindsay and they give him Ivan George and they're building him towards this, this Conor McGregor fight to the point where they give him Dustin Poirier, the former Conor McGregor victim. Joe Duffy goes off as a minus 145 favorite against Dustin Poirier on the merit of what he had been Ivan George and Jake Lindsay, right? And if not, but, but he beat Conor McGregor. Mm -hmm. So that gets him a big fight over Poirier and he loses the Poirier fight beats Mitch Clark beats resume daddy, lose to James Vick, lose to Mark Dia Casey. But it's important to note in the James Vick fight, he's a minus 175 favorite in the Dia Casey fight. He's a minus 185 favorite in this fight. He's on two fight losing streak. Okay, he hasn't fought in, in in a year, over a year, like again, sixteen months. He's a minus three seventy five favorite. At what point do you gotta just think just a little bit? Like, fuck, man, he's he's massively over. Right now, his boxing looks crisp. It does, and his jujitsu, it's actually not bad. His wrestling's not very good. His cardio is okay, but it's just like there's laws of inactivity. There's been injuries. There's been losing all of his fights that he's lost. All three of them is come as him being the favorite in fights that you were like, wow, what a letdown. Well, not, I, I, it just, I can't get behind him. So I think when you look at a price tag like this, and again, he's coming in, he's another big favorite. Everybody seems to like him. He's 345. Like you said, he'll probably go off closer to 500. It seems like these are one of these guys that you would make as a parlay piece, as a key piece. He'll just walk over Joel Alvarez. You said it your best. Joel Alvarez is best thing is his grappling, which is perfect because don't strike with Joe Duffy. If you're going to be Joe Duffy, do exactly what Dia Casey did. Do exactly, you know what? Porty is a great striker. You know what he did against Dustin, or against Joe Duffy? Took him down. Do the same thing. It's going to be way harder for Joel Alvarez. Now, I don't know if Alvarez has guys. the wrestling to do that, but we'll see. Yeah, but again, Joe Duffy's wrestling's not great by any stretch. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that Joel Alvarez is going to be the guy that takes him down, but I, I don't know. It's just, you know, Reza Daddy is a, gr- is a good wrestler. He was got him down. D.A. Casey's proven to be a very serviceable wrestler. He got him down. Poirier is a good wrestler. He got him down. So it's easy, you know, it's easy to say, oh, geez, he's got taken down a bunch. He's going to take him down by good guys. Joel Alvarez, don't stack with those guys. But if there is a path to victory against Duffy, it's get those takedowns. Go in there, take this guy down. Do what you got to do and uh, grind him up. Grind him up. Make this a dirty fight. He's capable of doing it. I'm not taking the underdog here, but I'm saying this is a favorite that I'm not agreeing. Yeah, baby, let's roll him to 500. Let's get some mm-hmm. money down. Like I, I agree, should be the favorite, and I fully agree, probably does win. But the uncertainty on it is a lot, is causing me to just say, I'm kind of going to walk away from this and hope Joe Duffy reestablishes himself and looks great and we're all talking about, about him again. But he's let down a lot of people. Quite a few times now. So you got to keep that in mind. And it just kind of took a skim through the props. And like, I don't know, nothing's really jumping off the page to me, to be perfectly honest. Fight is kind of expected. Uh, fight goes to decisions minus 135. Like, uh, Duffy by decision is plus 110. Like, none of the pop, none of these props are really jumping off the page to me either. 
Uh, probably just a better, maybe a, just a better stay away. We'll see how the rest of the week shakes out. I'm sure I'll probably end up with Joe Duffy in some sort of long shot parlay. But yeah, obviously not a, uh, not a priority for me this week. Montel Jackson takes on Brett, uh, the Pikey Johns. Montel Jackson, a minus 200 favorite. Johns, plus 170. What's your take here? Um, what was, sorry, let me just look at the line again. Minus uh, 200, plus 170. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, listen, I think we're all getting on Montel Jackson. Here's a good little prospect. He's super athletic. And the greatest thing about Montel Jackson is you could say, oh, geez, you're 20 years old, not the youngest guy in the world. It's the fact that he just hasn't been fighting for a long time. The guy turned pro mid-2017. He's been fighting for three years. So to consider that he's gone from fighting professional for three years to now being in the UFC, being a two-to-one favorite over Brett Johns, who's a judo black belt, was on the rush, uh, wrestling team, you know, a guy that's fought in top competition in the UFC. Considering that he's a big favorite over a guy like that, maybe it is a little bit of too much too soon. And I think that was the same thing with his UFC debut, you know, where he takes on Ricky Simon. And here's a guy that he's developing, and he's young, and he looks like a nice prospect, and he's the favorite over Ricky Simon. But he's just not there yet. You know, Ricky Simon is the better wrestler, and Ricky Simon does exactly that. He just grapples him, gets a hold of him, is able to have some decent spots, and, and gets the win. Since then, he's looked good. But Brian Kelleher, he's way bigger than Kelleher. Andre Sukmantath, Felipe Corrales. Now against Brett Johns, it's like here's a guy that could do exactly what Simon did, and that's try to get a hold of you and try to wrestle you down. But with Johns, it, it goes back to he's super reckless. He's there to get hit, and it's like for whatever reason, he's here's a guy with great cardio, fantastic cardio. But I don't know if it's the damage. I don't know if it's the pace. I don't know what it is, but it just seems like he, he gets really sloppy. Like he diverts from his game plan and all of a sudden like his tight technical skills kind of go out the window and it becomes a war and it becomes a, a drag him out slobber knocker. And against Montel, Montel Jackson, because you're giving up some of those physical gifts, you're giving up the reach, you're giving up the length, you're giving up speed. speed. Exactly. He's, he's going to get hit. And I don't know that just marching forward and trying to put hands on this guy is, is your best weapon. And then the last thing is with Montel Jackson, everyone talks about how he's got the biggest hand in the UFC or something. Like he's unbelievably strong. So we talk about Ricky Simon taking him down. Ricky Simon is a credible former collegiate wrestler who could take down many guys in the division. Mm-hmm. And yet this guy was struggling with Montel Jackson and his grip and his strength. And this guy's been fighting pro for two fucking years. So chances are that he, he is going to make these improvements every time out. And he should give you a good you know idea of that in this fight now i'm a big brett johns guy i've never bet against brett johns and that's been stupid because he's fighting guys like aljamain sterling and, and, and pedro munoz but i've just had so much faith in this guy however it's at some point you got to realize the limitations of certain people and in brett johns's case he needs to get good stylistical matchup for him they could be fun fights they could be i i still think he's a live dog in the spot because of his experience over Montel Jackson. But the physical gifts are definitely going in Jackson's favor. And I can see Jackson just staying to the outside, carving this guy up, keeping the fight standing, and making it uh, make, making himself look good. You know what they say about people with uh, big hands. Big feet. Big gloves. Um, no, but actually what I was going to say is the speed advantage for Montel Jackson, add that to a five-and-a-half-inch reach advantage – Brett Johns has to get this thing to the mat, has to find a submission, because at range, he's going to get chewed up. Um, so, yeah, it's really on Montel Jackson. If you can just keep the range, which he seems pretty good at, but sometimes he just he gets a little bit too involved in the grappling. He's a, you know, a young prospect. or He's 28 now, but he's a prospect, a budding prospect with just a world of talent here. Um, yeah, keep this at range, and you will chew up Brett Johns. Uh, I'm with you. Montel Jackson is the pick here. Uh, we move on, and I think uh, you may be one of the best experts on this next one. We got Amir Elbazi. I've never heard of this guy before, but he's taking on Malcolm Gordon, uh, adrenaline uh, training center guy, uh, kind of a Canadian standout in the uh, lower weight classes for a long time here. Uh, Albazi, minus 165. Uh, uh, Malcolm Gordon, plus 135. What's your take here? Yeah, so Malcolm Gordon actually uh, helped put together his second pro fight, a substance cage combat one against Ahmed Akar. And yeah, I mean, I'm very happy to see him finally get his opportunity in the UFC. He's been fighting professional for eight years. He's got wins over UFC veterans already. Chris, Chris Kalaitis, who he had beaten back in the day in Bellator. Um, he beat tough Yoni Sherbatov. That was kind of his win that propelled him to this spot. I'm happy to finally see Malcolm Gordon get his spot after all this time. Uh, local guy, like you said, adrenaline MMA. And, uh, and and as much as it is nice is that I have also been cage side for like seven of his fights. 
including the majority of his losses. And in those losses, it's like, man, I don't know that he's UFC caliber. Now, what he has going for him is that UFC caliber is not a real thing anymore. Like, they're taking a lot of guys into the UFC, so there's going to be a lower level. And could Malcolm Gordon beat some of the guys that are in the UFC? Absolutely, he could beat some of the guys in the UFC. But in that, it's, it's more so we got to gauge how good Amir Albazi is. Because even with Malcolm Gordon, right? Malcolm Gordon starts off his career. He's a Muay Thai striker. He's not only adrenaline training center, like you said, but he's Team Tompkins specifically. So Sean Thompson's got him under his wing. He's training with Sam Stout. He's training with Mark, Mark Hominick, Chris Horidecki, Chris Clements. You know, all the great world-class strikers that came out of adrenaline. Striker. Once once, um, once Sean Tompkins passed away, the gym kind of got away from striking. And I'm not to say that they switched up the game plan. It's that they just had bad success in striking. Mark Hominick had to suffer you know, a, a string of losses. He's getting outstruck by guys like Eddie Yagen. Like, in what world does Mark fucking Hominick get outstruck by Eddie Yagen and Pablo Garza? In what fucking world, Paul? But it happened. And then and then Chris Hordecki, you know, just, like, falls off the map and ends up getting t- t- or gets knocked out by Derek Gauthier, a 500 fighter in Quebec. Sam Stout. Sam Stout is all of a sudden getting knocked out in all of his fights. You know, he can't he can't get a win in the UFC. And he's, he's getting KO'd. I mean, he retires young because just, like, Guy used to have an iron chin and great striking. It's just like, no, it's just not there anymore. So the gym kind of fell apart, and Gordon kind of got shuffled to the wayside. During that time, he's getting knocked out. He's supposed he's known for striking. Randy Turner, who was a, a, an Army guy from Ottawa, knocked him out violently. Austin Ryan, who was a regional show guy that didn't really want to pursue MMA all that much, knocked him out violently. But kudos to Malcolm Gordon, who is a fighter and wants this really bad. He switches up his game plan to jujitsu at this point. Mm -hmm. And now he can strike, but he starts working heavily on his ground game. The Dimitri Waterberg fight, I'm live for that fight. Talked to Gordon beforehand. He actually moved up to 135 pounds for that fight. or was a catchweight to 130. He tried to stand in front of Dimitri Waterberg, and he got chewed up. His lead leg got absolutely annihilated. He couldn't move on it. Now that he's a sitting target, he couldn't move out of the way of the punches. He got knocked out by Dimitri Waterberg. He was 11 and 17 at the time, right? Or 11 and 7 mm-hmm. at the time. Not a great prospect. Is the Since then, he's put together a four fight winning streak. But this is what's key, and I want you to remember the Jordan Graham fight, he's getting hurt. Stand up. He gets the fight to the ground, slaps on a nasty triangle choke, ends up getting in like a triangle Kimura out of it. It's a nice little submission. Jordan Graham was 2 0. The Yoni Sherbatov fight, which is the biggest win of his career, he is getting lit up standing. He falls over. He, he, he gets, I wouldn't say it's, he doesn't get dropped. He gets knocked down. Like, he falls over from the punches. And then as he's on the ground, Yoni Sherbatov just thinks the fight's over, just swarms him, and Gordon fucking hits a switch on him, gets on his back, puts him in a rear choke. Mm-hmm. And that was a fucking year ago. Actually, to be exact, that was 15 months ago. Yeah. And th- that, that, that's, you know, I don't know, man. Yeah, how did, how, did he, and, how did he get the call to go to Fight Island? It seems kind of... Well, so he signed a contract with Brave FC, right? He couldn't yeah. get a fight in... What happened is TKO went down under. He's a TKO flyweight champion. So TKO's got these really shitty contracts where they just don't let guys out of contracts. So he sat around for a little bit waiting for TKO to come back. They announced a show, TKO 49. It was six months after he fought Sherbatov, and they canceled it. So at this point, he's like, yo, let me out of my contract. They let him out of this contract. He signs with Brave, see, uh, Brave, which is over in, like, you know, Amman, Jordan, and all different different little places, right? But a good promotion. So he signs with them and they got a flyweight tournament. And then because of this coronavirus thing, they canceled. They allowed, they told the UFC, if you want any of the guys that were on our upcoming shows or from the flyweight tournament, you can have them. And these guys were all in the flyweight tournament. His original opponent, Alexei, uh, like that Dong to Chuck, I'm pretty sure Amir al was in the tournament as well. They were all 125 pound guys that were going to fight in this brave tournament. So the UFC just brought over a couple of the guys from the tournament. He was initially going to take Alexander. Like I mentioned, that guy got hurt. Now he's just getting Amir al So, I would have to say, as far as rating him as a fighter goes, he's a BJJ black belt, mm-hmm. but training in Toronto, is he trains at Toronto BJJ, and he's from London. So the difference between London and Toronto, fuck, man, it's like an hour and a half. So it's crazy to think that he's spending his time doing that all the time. At but Toronto BJJ, Toronto BJJ has been under quarantine, has not been open. It's still not. still not been open now. So he's not grappling there. He's not grappling with anybody. He hasn't gone anywhere. Like Laramie's in Vegas, you know, like uh, Kyle Nelson and even Balbita, like they, they all went to Vegas beforehand. All those guys went to the States, were training in the States, and if I get a fight on there. Gordon didn't know he was getting this fight. He was under the impression the fight he was originally having was canceled mm-hmm. because of the virus for Brave. So I don't really know realistically that he's Where been he's training. At. He's got some wish. Yeah, like some wicked training camp. Like I, I, I don't really know. So I would say he's not in the greatest shape. He's giving up the striking advantage. He's giving up the wrestling advantage. And yeah, he does have the jiu-jitsu advantage. 
But if you're not going to get the fight to the ground and this guy stands you up and beats you up standing, it's going to be a, it's going to be a fucking bad night for him, man. So, so looking at Amir Bazi, he's like, well, can he do that? So he hadn't really fought anybody up until Bellator 179. A couple of years ago, Bellator signed him that Jamie Powell fight. I remember that fight, and, but but I remember he beats Jamie Powell like 30-25, 30-26, 30-26. Like he mopped him. His next mm-hmm. fight with Bellator, first round submission. Again, nice little prospect. It's a good win for him. Takes Bellator us. doesn't have a flyweight division. So Bellator doesn't retain his services. He's just a European guy they're going to use on the European cards. It's no knock against him. It's just quite simply Bellator doesn't have a roster spot for him. So then fighting Jose Torres in Brave, again in Brave, in, in a good fight, First round, you know, he gets stuffed. Uh, he gets outstruck. And that's Torres a, is moving forward the whole time. That's but he's a throwing real, on him. real. That's a real name. Like I know Shorty Torres got cut when they kind of got rid of the flyweight division, but like he had no business getting cut. Yeah, he was. He didn't look great in the UFC, but realistically, yeah, he's a nine one pro. He's the former Titan FC flyweight champion. He's the former Titan FC bantamweight champion. Mm-hmm. And the guy was twenty three and zero as an amateur and then captured the IMAF fucking gold at the world. Right, like. He's a very credited fighter. His law, by the way, oh, let's laugh at him because he beat Jared Brooks. Jared Brooks knocked himself out. Jared his, Brooks. His losses, to, hey. his, his losses to Alex Perez. Alex Perez is legitimately yeah. good and, and hey. will challenge for a title in the near future. Hey, and as Jared Brooks told him, you didn't beat me. I beat myself by slamming myself on my head. And it's funny on Tapology, yeah, yeah. it's ground and pound after botched slam is how they yeah. uh, is how they, which is exactly what happened. Uh, yeah, he had a no, bad that's, that's he exactly had a bad UFC happened. run, but like one and one, losing to Alex Perez, like the guy should have had another shot. Um, but they thought they were going to get rid of the division, kind of a big old mess. But yeah, that's a decent win for, or that's a, yeah, sorry, at first first loss, it's like that's that's not the end of the world whatsoever. Right. First round, Jose Torres is moving forward on him. He's backing him up. He's landing the better strikes, but it's competitive. The second round, he takes Torres' back. Like It's a nice little scramble. He gets on his back. He's got good BJJ. As he's on his back, I mean, he controls the rest of the round from that position. It's 1-1 going into the third. And in the third, I mean, it's a throwdown. But Jose Torres does get the better of him. Jose Torres does secure late takedown and gets the victory. But like, and, and I tell you this all the time. A lot of people say they don't understand it, but I tell you this all the time. I love when a guy loses a tough fight like that. Because it's like, dude, he was 10-0. and He needed to lose. I mean, here's a kid who's 25 years old fighting a UFC veteran. He's 10 and 0 in a in a credible promotion like Brave. He's a Bellator veteran. You got to see what he's worth. You got to see what he's made out of. And then losing will allow him to see how much as he wants us. Go back to the drawing board, improve, make those lifestyle changes, do what you got to do. But you're going to get a better version of the guy later on. You you grow from your losses. If you have no losses, where did the growth come from, so to speak? And he did just that. He comes back against Ryan Curtis, another you know decent enough little prospect, not a guy with a ballooned up record or anything, and, and gets a nice little win over him. He's actually he's actually sponsored by um, that paradigm pair pair something. Mm-hmm. Don't really know how to pronounce it. Anyways, what's important to know there is that they don't really take on a ton of clients. Like their clients include Israel Adesanya, Chris Cyborg, Conor McGregor, Leon Edwards. And Leon Edwards, coincidentally enough, at London Shoot Fighter, which is where Amir Albazi is. He's he's um, managed by them. They've got high expectations for this kid, and I and I think that that's you know this is a good fight for him. I, I feel like what I've seen on tape, he seems like he's got the better skill set. I would like to see him get exposed. So you can see, listen, where he got exposed against Jose Torres was a good fight against a tough guy. And hey, man, these guys threw down. He won the second round. It was a gut check performance. It would that's what was exposing him, right? In Gordon's all three of Gordon's losses, he was knocked out once in the first round, twice in the second round. In the win, in the biggest win of his career, Yoni Sherbatov, he was almost knocked out. In the second biggest win of his career, Jordan Graham was a two and zero prospect, and again got his ass kicked standing. Like, is he an overachiever? Did he pick up some big wins in some tight spots? Like, I I, I fully believe he deserves to be here. But he deserves to be here because of the time he's put into the sport and the effort he's given to the sport. Maybe not because of these big wins. And the last thing I want to say is before the Yoni Sherbatov fight, he hit me up. I, I do. I, well, I was doing Canadian rankings. I had him as the number two flyweight in the world. Keep in mind, he's literally beaten James Mancini and Jordan Graham. They have a combined record of seven three or seven and three. Jordan Graham was two and zero. Oh, James Mancini was five and three. Outside of that, he hadn't beaten anybody, and he had lost to the other flyweights in Canada, Randy Turner, Austin Ryan, and Demetri Warrenberg, who was more of a band away, but it was catchweight at 130. Mm-hmm. And, he, and he hit me up on, on Facebook to be like, why why am I not the number one flyweight in the world? It's just like, who cares, dude? You fight Yoni Sherbatov. You have a fight coming up with him. Beat him. You're the number one guy in the world. And he was like real real upset about just like, 
how am I not the number one guy in the world? And then you look at his body of work and his resume. It's like he hadn't he hadn't done anything to have a claim like that. Like Sherbatov knocked out fuck or Sherbatov beat Zach Makovsky. Sherbatov was on the Ultimate Fighter. Sherbatov mixed it up with fucking high level guys. He has a draw against Tyson Nam. You think you're fucking better than this guy? On what fucking merit? Then the fight happens and he gets his fucking ass kicked. Falls to the ground and gets a rear naked choke. I don't know, man. I don't know. I know it sounds like I'm getting mad and I'm disrespecting him. I don't mean to. I just mean I got to fade his ass here and go Amir Albazi. But Albazi takes it down. I've been giving you a lot of decision props in this one. I couldn't give you one here. I think Albazi could win a decision. I think Albazi could knock him out. I think Albazi probably doesn't submit him. Gordon has spent a lot of time on his, on his BJJ. But honestly, if you discombobulate this guy and then choke him out, that's possible too. So I, I think Albazi is going to get the victory. Cool. Uh, we got Armin Sarukian taking on Davi Ramos. This fight probably deserves to be a lot further up the card. I I don't know if this is the actual formal uh, layout for it, but this is a, this is a very very good fight between two skilled guys, kind of buried deep down in these prelims. Sarukian. I don't know if many fighters have had a harder intro to the UFC. Just being like a random guy. Not a random guy, but like, you know, just walking this guy in and being like, hey, welcome to the UFC. Have you heard of Isla Makachev? Well, he's your debut. Goes to the decision, gets take, taken down four times, doesn't really get off on too many strikes, but like, Islam's a damn stud. So, like, what are you going to do? At, well, you know, that's a tough, tough spot. Then they give him Olivia Oban Mercier. Another tough, uh, another good spot, uh, or sorry, tough spot. Against a pretty uh, experienced guy in the division. Doesn't really throw all that much. Got a couple takedowns, but like 47 strikes. Davi Ramos, on the other hand, like world-class jiu-jitsu. But the problem with it is doesn't really have the wrestling to get the fight to the mat. I see Armin Sarukian getting a uh, stand-up uh, decision victory here. He's minus 200. Um, the prop on the decision is Turkey M by decision. Sorry, just looking up on a best fight. Minus 130. So the books are pretty wise to that as well. Um, so yeah, my mind is at uh, uh, Saruki and by decision. I don't know if I want to bet the minus 130 there. What's your take on this one? Because the thing about it is like Ramos, at least when they're on the feet, he throws a lot more. Sarukian is very impressive from in terms of like the skill set and everything that you see. It's just like the guy's pretty quick. He's got uh, great technique. He's got good wrestling. He looks like an all-around martial artist, but my the volume is concerning. But that being said, he's taking on opponents that barely ever get hit. What uh, o- Olivia Oban Mercier has that one fight that like he didn't absorb a significant strikes. Or a significant strike, and I believe it was like Brett Apley posted uh, something about Islam Makachev in like in his last three fights has absorbed like under fifty significant strikes or something like that combined. So a tough spot. Maybe maybe this is the time that we see him turn it up, and the volume kind of reaches what we see as talent. But if Davi Ramos can't get this fight to the mat. I'm going to have to go with Sarukian based on what I've seen in the UFC. What's your take here? Yeah, I go with Sarukian as well. I mean, he's got a freestyle wrestling background, and the guy's got the chops. Coming to the UFC, it's like they must have had high expectations for him or or, or don't like the guy or something because, man, he's 21 years old, and you're going to debut him off 22, I think, and you're debuting him with Islam Makachev. Like, damn, talk about a tough task. Mm-hmm. And Makachev, not really much of a finisher, but still, I mean, he gave an okay account of himself. You're grappling with one of the best grapplers in the division. And that's his game as well. Like, that's what Sarukian wants to do. It just it's a bad matchup. Against Olive Obey Mercy, it's like, oh man, you know, now he's getting another BJJ black belt and uh you know, someone someone who's got good wrestling and is I mean Obey Mercy wrestled on the uh the Canadian national team and he was he's a judo black belt, same thing, like he's got good grappling. Is he gonna do the same thing? But it's like Sarukian's just wise to it, man. Like this guy's strong and he's developing, he's developing quickly. Again, he's only twenty three years old, born in nineteen ninety six. He's just, he's going to make these improvements every time out. Now that I think he's spending some time with Tiger Muay Thai and all these, you're seeing he's refining out his game where his striking is getting better. But he's just making some better choices in there. He's a little less raw, a little less raw deal. I would have to say, especially when you saw him fight Islam Makachev, it's like he's just a raw, inexperienced, you know, this term would be a poor man's version of Islam Makachev. 
Then when you see what Davi Ramos did against Islam Makachev, which is quite literally absolutely fucking nothing, it's like a poor man's version will make this look tighter, but it'll still get the job done. Davi Ramos just like out of sorts. Listen, we all know how good his jitsu is. We know he's a former ADCC competitor. We know he's a high-level black belt. But yeah, his wrestling just is, is not up to snuff. Not only is his wrestling not up to snuff, his cardio is not very good. And he's one of these guys that's smart enough to realize if I exert myself trying to get the fight to the ground and I do get the fight to the ground, I'm going to be tired. So I might as well just wait for that one opportunity, try to flop to my back, try to maybe just lull this guy in, but he's not doing enough. And against Makachev, Makachev doesn't want to take him down for the most part. You know, I'd rather keep this fight standing. You've got good BJJ. I'm a good wrestler, but I know I can outstrike you. And it's as far as the striking goes, Davi Ramos does nothing in that fight. Davi Ramos landed two significant strikes in round one, five significant strikes in round two, and zero significant strikes in round three. Mind you, the fight literally took place at distance for the most part. Makachev dropped him. Makachev hurt him. Makachev didn't put him away. He was durable enough for that. Now he's taking on Saruki, and I honestly just think it's going to be the same thing. He doesn't have the wrestling to take Saruki down. He obviously is not going to throw enough punches, nor does he have enough power to just zap Saruki in standing, although Saruki has lost a fight prior in his career. His only other loss outside of Makachev got knocked down 30 seconds. But again, he's like 18 years old or something when the fight happened. So, uh, yeah, he's 19 years old in two months. Like It's a long time ago. He's grown. He's growing. And I think this is a good spot against Davi Ramos, who, you know, it just hasn't really looked like a, a high-end competitor in the UFC. His wins over three guys that are released. And Austin Hubbard, he got lucky. He fought Hubbard while Hubbard was young in his career and developing. And if he's going to be Sarukian, now's the time to do it. Because you don't want to fight 26-year-old Sarukian. You don't want to fight 28-year-old Sarukian. You want to fight him right now when he's 23. But even then, I just think he's got too much in. He's got too much in store for him. Keeps the fight standing, chips away at him, better striking, more output, gets the decision. Yeah, sorry to follow up on that stat. So Islam Makachev, eight fights in the UFC. One of them was obviously a first round uh, loss to Adriano Martins. What a crazy result that was. Fifty-seven strikes abs- or significant strikes absorbed in eight fights. Divided by eight. And a bunch of those are decisions. So the average is allowing like seven significant strikes absorbed per fight. So Sarukian got to 13 strikes in a three-round fight. I mean, that's twice twice the amount of volume that the average person gets on, on Makachev. And it's not like Makachev is just icing fools in the first round every single time. He's got one, two, three, uh, four. Four of those eight fights have, have went the distance. And he's never eaten more than... 13 strikes. So tough matchup for Sarukian to to ever get a bunch of uh, of volume uh, racking up against a guy like Makachev. So, yeah, maybe this is the moment. This is the time to turn that up a little bit. Because, um, yeah, if he, as long as you keep this on the feet, as long as you stay out of uh, any sort of uh, grappling with Davi Ramos, he should win this all day. And finally, we've got... Sergey Spivak taking on Carlos Felipe Spivak minus one sixty. Felipe plus one forty. Got any thoughts on this one? Yeah, I mean this is another big question mark fight. When you hear the story on uh, Carlos Felipe, Let's hear it. it just doesn't even yeah, it doesn't even fucking add up. Like, how does any of this make sense? Okay, so first of all, by his own accord, he's three hundred and forty-seven pounds at the age of fourteen. Oh, right? Boy. He's morbidly obese. Everybody wants to fight him. He's getting bullied. Someone says you should take boxing as a way to lose some weight. Starts going to boxing. Starts losing some weight. Starts trimming down. And then starts uh, getting a couple fights here and there. Okay, But yet, he's photographed as having a BJJ black belt at the age of 19. Not known for his grappling, Paul. Known as a boxer. <laughs> yet somehow he completed a BJJ black belt in five years going from 200, three, sorry, 347 pounds all the way down, 347 pounds all the way down to, geez, I think it was like 270 at the time. Well, I just don't know where, at what point do you collect a BJJ butt, but it doesn't matter. goes on about his career. At this point in his career, he's winning a couple low-level fights, moving along. He's still young, looks a little herky-jerky, looks a little stiff, but, but you know what? He's exciting. He wants to go out there. He wants to throw down. The UFC is going to Sao Paulo. They sign him. The, the year is 2017. He's 22 years old. He has an 8-0 record. And they're signing him up to fight Christian Colombo, who you will remember, the awfulest heavyweight that fought in the UFC. And Felipe gets flagged by USADA. 
he gets flagged by USADA. So again, this is a guy that never competed in the UFC, was signed to the UFC three fucking years ago. Okay, and then just initially gets popped right off the bat. Now, the UFC signing a kid that was only 22 years old, a little bit weird. Also, what's his background? Like, is he a BJJ guy? He, he got that black belt pretty quick, but you could watch him grapple online. He fucking sucks. He can't get up. <laughs> like, he's in a grappling tournament against a 45-year-old man, and he's on his back, and he can't get up. It's like, I don't understand what's going on here. So, so you was you saw to catches him and unlike uh, our georgian friend dolis from earlier he doesn't rat nobody out and so he he takes a full 2 year suspension right the ufc cuts him they're like we have no use for you you never fought for us you're not under contract they they release him right during that time he realizes fuck this usada thing says i can't fight professionally so he starts fighting amateur He's been amateur boxing. He's been amateur kickboxing. And of course, jiu-jitsu tournaments are considered amateur. But he has been keeping at it. He has been doing stuff. And that's why you'll see even on his topology, he's got a, a listed boxing bout. It's not a professional bout. And if you click on the card, it's like a 13-fight MMA card with one single four-round boxing match. Yeah, I saw Which that, is man. the first fight of the night. They're just tailor-made. Hey, dude, sorry you're under suspension. Now, here's what I don't get. His suspension runs out, okay? He's not fought in MMA. He's done nothing to prove himself. And the UFC, they re-signed him. They didn't say, oh, shit, your suspension's up. You had a contract. No, no, no. They physically re-signed him. And that I don't I don't know why. So I'm going to assume he's only 25 now. I'm going to assume this guy has made a lot of improvements in the off time. I'm going to assume this guy is a decent athlete. He is in decent shape. And that he has been competing a lot. And and I am purely basing this on the speculation that I think he would have made those improvements. Whereas Spivak, you can tell he's been working on his boxing. You can tell he's been working on his wrestling. I just don't think he's all that good. And, uh, you know, the Tai Tui Vasa fight, that's his, his lone victory in the UFC. That's his one little bright spot. Tai beats himself, man. Like, Tai gets taken down six times in the first round, five of them based on naked kicks that he didn't set up that he just threw, like, like, I have no idea what Ty was thinking in that fight, but it's a fu- it's an abysmal performance. And then against Walt Harris, he gets smoked out. And against Marcin Tabora, he just wasn't physical enough. The latter fight there, the Marcin Tabora fight, is what I'm going to draw some some relevance from because he just wasn't physical enough for Tybura, who's a guy that comes in 250. Spivak, I mean, he's tall. He's tall, he's lanky. You can tell he's trying to put some mass on. You can try he's trying to try to fill out that form. And again, he's only like 25 years old as well. He should be getting better. But... I think that physicality would be a big problem. I think Felipe probably just presses him up in the cage, maybe tries to take him down. If he does take him down, technically he has a black belt. So, I mean, he, he should be completely lost as far as top position goes, but it's that boxing range. He seems a little faster. He seems a little bit crisper. And I think that he's just going to push it a little bit forward. But the smart play is passed. You have middling heavyweights, right? One guy hasn't fought in three years. <laughs> I, I don't know, man. And he popped, by the way. Mm-hmm. So... Now he's not on the juice and he's coming off a three year long absence and he's taking on another fellow middling heavyweight mm-hmm. in the first fight of the night. It's got disaster spilt all over it. But obviously when you're talking DraftKings, Which... like these are the kind of fights you're probably going to end up having to have some type of exposure to. Of course. And we do have to talk about them all. So it's just, it's just part of it. Right. Of course. Um, let's just jump quickly into that right now. I'm going to run through the 9K range, I'm, and we're going to break down who are the best plays. So 9,000 and above, we have Joe Duffy, 93, Grant Dawson, 92, Montel Jackson, 91, Figueredo, 9,000. Who's your favorite up there? I'm going to say my favorite is going to be uh, Davidson Figueredo. As we talked about, I think there's a lot of decisions on this card, but Figueredo has that kind of earmark that he could definitely get a repeat KO. Maybe it doesn't happen in the second round. Maybe it happens a little bit later, and maybe he doesn't land as many strikes as you want up until that point. But uh, five rounds to work with, good possibility for the finish. 9,000, you got to go with. I think Joe Duffy, people are going to say 9,300. You know, he's he's a guarantee earmark. I'm fat avoiding that one Mm -hmm. altogether. Maybe he is the guy. Maybe he does give us that great performance that we've been expecting out of him. But I I just, I can't fully get behind it. And then uh, the $9,200 that you were talking about for Grant Dawson. Grant Dawson's the kind of guy that could score a lot. Mm -hmm. Because he's he's relentless. He scores lots of takedowns. And his transitional game on the ground allows him to score a lot. But of the three of them. I would think because Figueredo is that two thousand dollars or that two hundred dollars cheaper. Uh, actually, you know what? He's going to be higher ownership as well. Way higher. Yeah, I would think the two the two picks would be Figueredo and Dawson. Dawson would be lower ownership, has a very high ceiling as well. Figueredo will be high ownership, but definitely has a good 
possibility to bust it off. And Duffy, I can see him being, you know, medium level ownership because he has a high price tag. But I personally just, I don't trust him. I'm going to have to avoid him. Yeah, I can get on board with that. Yeah, Grant Dawson, three fights in the UFC, breaks 100 all three times versus Arosa, 104 points. Trezano, 111. Minner, he's uh, 106. He's always going for takedowns. He's always clearing value. I know Nad Naramani has pretty decent pretty decent wrestling um, for a British guy. Um, but, yeah, hope um, you know, younger, stronger, Grant Dawson. And the, the beauty of him is he just sticks to the game plan. No love for Montel Jackson in there, in there though? Like, if, yeah, if, you, if he's way faster and Brett Johns is, you know, so hittable, like, I don't know. I, I find I never end up playing Montel Jackson. And, I mean, last time against Kolaris, I'd obviously... I mean, I didn't see the 11 takedowns coming. Shame on me. Um, what are you going to do? That's, uh, yeah, I, I feel like, yeah, the, the, st- the style of fight for Montel Jackson that we're hoping that he fights, unless he gets a knockout, he probably doesn't get to value. He's never cleared 100 significant strikes um, in the UFC. So unless unless, he has, unless, that, unless that, there's the exact problem, yeah, unless he's getting the takedowns, then he's probably not getting value, or at least not outscoring the other guys up top. All right, now I'm gonna run through the top of the AK range. You ready? We got Delize, Pantoja, Sarukian, Albazi, Jacasi. 89, 88, 87, 86, and 85. Who do you like in there? Yeah, I like uh, Albazi at 86. Uh, again, he's still he's an unproven, you know, commodity at this point in his UFC debut. But I feel like Gordon has durability issues, and that should be allow Albazi to either hustle him up or at some point maybe score a finish. Uh, if he was able to score a finish, I mean that would be that would be nice. Other guy I like is Marti Casey. Marti has shown in his last two fights uh, a propensity to go to that grappling, stick to that grappling. And Fizeev has looked, I think, out of sorts enough on the ground that if Dia Casey gets him where he wants him. He'll just keep working, and he'll just keep working. And and the one thing that's a little bit of buyer beware there is we've seen this past weekend on DraftKings, the scoring is like somebody could score 80 significant strikes in ground and pound, and they'll credit you with 30 and tell you to go fuck Yeah, the ground like, strikes they're are not, – They're not scoring ground strikes. It's not, what the fuck? It's not DraftKings, though. It is fight metric. Um, it's fight, yeah, no, no, I'm just saying people are playing DraftKings, and then they're the ones complaining to me, well, why didn't I get this many points? It's the people at fight metric. I get that. What I'm saying, though, is if they're not – if it's they're very not inconsistent. And I just punched sure. you six times in the face on the ground, and they're going to credit you with one of them. Then that's the problem. Is Dia Casey's not? See, here's the difference between a guy like Grant Dawson, who we expect to have the grappling and using it, and Dia Casey, who is going to have the grappling and using it. Grant Dawson takes you down, and he gets moving. He's going to move to side control. He's yeah. going to try to mount. He's going to get advances. To back. And they as tend, soon as he, as, they tend exactly, to score as soon as that he starts stuff. Shaking off. As soon as he starts shaking off the back, he won't just stick with it and get reversed. He'll slip off the back. He'll go back down to side control. He'll keep moving. He'll elbow you. He'll chop away with you. Dia Casey's a little bit smarter. He's not as reckless. He will get a good position, and he will pin you down and hold you down. Mm-hmm. And that's going to allow him to be a little less scoring. But he's only $8,500. That is obviously you know, $700 less than a guy like Grant Dawson. Is a tougher fight for him than it should be for a guy like Grant Dawson. But I definitely see some merit in the $8,500 for Dia Casey. Um, yeah, I, I, I totally am on board with that. Um, yeah, Sarukin, we kind of talked about. He just hasn't showed the volume. And Pantoja against Askarov. I mean, if it just ends up being a stand-up affair between the two of them, then, yeah, you're kind of, you need a Pantoja finish to uh, to really get him up to where you need him to be. I mean, all of the times that he actually scores big, it's all because of finish. Uh, what's his best decision win here? Yeah, he scored 60 points against Eric Shelton way back when in a decision win against Moreno. He scored 76 points. He's just like, unless he's getting the finish and, you know, um, and Askarov is a pretty competent grappler himself, probably should, shouldn't have too many problems keeping the fight on the feet. Uh, if it stays, yeah, stand-up war between the two of them, probably isn't going to do it. So I'm on board with you there. All right, uh, low eights. We got Spivak, Ariana Lipsky, uh, Gastelum, and then Hermanson. Uh, let's just go through the whole mid range. So we got all these like you know close pick em fights. Spivak, uh, Spivak versus Felipe. It sounds like I guess you're leaning towards Felipe. 
Because that this one, yeah. like these middling heavyweight fights, like a lot of the times, you know, this is the cheap punt guy that you need. So Felipe, it sounds like that may be a play um, there. Gaslam, we were kind of talking about the the volume just usually isn't there on the feet, and I don't anticipate him taking and controlling Jack Hermanson down and, and doing all of that. He's probably going to win from, you know, a little bit crisper hands, in my opinion. Yeah, that's a fight I'm probably staying away from. I guess Hermanson, if if he can follow, like, the Chris Weidman path, and, and yeah, he just out-muscles Kelvin Gastelum, uses that size advantage, and is able to take him down. I suppose at 8,000, he's actually a pretty decent play as well. Um, otherwise, down here, it gets a little bit ugly. I guess Luana Carolina, 7,900. If we just think that she's going to throw like 100 significant strikes again and, and, and win against Lipsky that way, I guess she's an option as well. well uh, any Anybody in this mid-range that you're interested in? Yeah, in the mid-range, I think Lu- Luana Carolina comes out there, it's striker versus striker, and she goes out and puts out another 100 you know, strike performance and gets the win, and $7,900 should be a, a very good play. Other people I'd be uh, looking at is, I, I know we talked about, not a great length, but just, you know, Montel Jackson is a good spot for him, and he's so much faster, and Brett Johns is hittable, but as far as $7,100 goes, if you're looking for a cash game option, Brett Johns is super durable. Like, Pedro Munoz had this guy on one leg. He had literally gotten floored like three times on leg kicks. He never quit though. He kept, he kept, he persevered to the end. He's got a great chin on him. He can take a good punch and he can score takedowns and he's a volume puncher as well. So for $7,100 on a cash game, you got a guy that could potentially spring the upset, but more so than that is going to stick around probably the 15 minutes and land some volume of himself. So he wouldn't be the terrible player for the 7,100. Mm-hmm. But then, yeah, going, going over to Carlos Felipe, he's only $7,800 and he's got that upside of maybe I can turn this guy's lights off. Maybe I can get this guy down and use my, you know, jiu-jitsu, I, I guess maybe he has jiu-jitsu again. I've yet to see it. But he's got that unknown edge to him. He's $7,800. He's a plus 140. And in many ways, it goes back to the Molly McCann fight from, from yesterday, quite literally. It's like we looked at her opponent as, ah, she's got one fight in the UFC and a ballooned-up record, and there's a lot of unknowns there. We know more about Molly McCann, Molly McCann, she can't And you know what? This girl came in fantastic shape and showed you she made improvements. She's only 27. She took that off time and got better. Carlos Felipe has been dreaming of this last three years. The fact that they re the fact that they signed a 22-year-old kid in the, in the first place as a heavyweight with a ballooned-up record means that there was something there. And then furthermore from that, for them to re-sign him after he burnt them, get suspended for two years like that, pulling out of a fight, bad look, for them to re-sign him on no basis. I mean, he didn't do anything. He didn't beat anybody new. He didn't He didn't do anything extra. Like, the fact that they're bringing him back into the fold means, you know, there's something there. You look at this past weekend, an awesome tidbit dropped on the UFC broadcast for uh, that Munir Lazez fight versus uh, Razak Al-Hassan is when they were saying, like, oh, Dana White's son's having a birthday party and some kid at the birthday is like, you got to check out this highlights from this guy, okay? That's that's a cool tidbit. No, no, no. Way better tidbit. That they that Dana takes it to Sean Shelby, and Sean Shelby's like, this guy can't fight. This guy's no good. If he wants to go to the UFC, we're giving him a tough fight. Fuck it. Give him whoever you want. Oh, we'll give him Al Hassan. Sean Shelby's the matchmaker. Sean Shelby's a talent scout. Sean Shelby's got a great eye. We, we pride ourselves on having a good eye. Sean Shelby saw the video of this guy and thought, this guy's no good. So for us to last week say, geez, this guy doesn't look all that good. Yo, we're seeing the same thing. Sean Shelby's seeing, right? But they, they got an eye. Them bringing Carlos Felipe back in the mix, them bringing him in the mix after he burnt them, it's because they see something. Mm-hmm. They're not bringing him in because he's just a putz to come get his ass kicked. They gave him Sergey Spivak. So, yeah, that unknown is intriguing to me. And $7,800, it's, it's worth a little shot, in my opinion. So I think as far as like a lower mid-range guy goes with some potential high upside, and you know what? Maybe he goes out there and it's like, holy fuck. But I don't – why would you sign him, re-sign him especially, if he's that embarrassing and he's going to let you down like that? Like, there's got to be a little something extra there. That's what I'm banking on for that one. So $7,800 worth of luck. With DraftKings lineups, like, you're going to have to take – you're going to have to be uncomfortable with your lineup a bit to make money. Um, otherwise, you end up on the lineup that everyone – you know, if you spend all of your money and you're like, oh, this this lineup, you know, I feel so safe with it. It's just like – some somebody, yeah, you know, Munir Lutlazes is going to upset an Al Hassan. Like some somebody shits in the apple pie, as we like to say. All right, um, the last thing we didn't really talk about from DraftKings perspective is uh, Dolidze versus Ibrahimov, seventy three hundred. Okay, here's the thing: it's really hard when you get down low 
in these lineups. It's just like, yeah, you were saying Brett the Bikey Johns. Uh, could be some merit to that. I just don't really want to step in front of that speed advantage for Jackson and that ele- or that six inch reach advantage. For all of the bad things I said about Hadi Zabrigamov, is that at least he's out there throwing when he's out oh, there. Oh, does he ever? So at seventy three hundred, if he's able to get a win, like when he lost to. Uh, da Ung Jung, he scored 52 points, lost in the third round by submission, basically rolled over, but 88 significant strikes and a takedown. Herman, 53 significant strikes and two takedowns. So the guy's at least active while he's out there. If he can pull off an upset victory against a guy who's had, what, a bunch of years off uh, out of action and coming off of a fly game from USADA and yada, yada, yada. I mean... I'll, I, I, it, my, my biggest challenge for DraftKings this week is deciding who the low-end loser is going to be. And I guess I'm down to Ibrahimov and Brett the Pikey Johns. Both guys I'm not actually picking to win, but I mean, it's, that's kind of the way you got to play these games these days. Yeah, and I think if you're playing that big GPP and you want that option of this guy could get that finish and score big for me, then I think you look at it, Brogdonov, because for as many issues as this guy does have, and he does, is that at least he will bomb your ass Mm -hmm. for three minutes, maybe three and a half minutes at the absolute most. Now, this is key here, because Razak Al-Hassan, you know, that's kind of all he does too. And there's certain guys that can take the punches, and most guys can't take the punches. Turns out, Lazez, he could take the punch. Mm-hmm. That was, you know, he could take it. But you know that now because he did take the punches. Ibrahimov has tried to bomb his last two opponents, and it didn't work. At least the one thing you could take a little bit of comfort in is, like, Dolez doesn't look like he's ever really been hit. And when someone gets bombing on him, and he doesn't got that extra high-octane fuel running through his course hmm. and through his fucking veins, then, then yeah, yeah, it, it, it's a, it could be a dirty fight, it could be a sloppy fight, and it could be a big scoring affair. For Ibrahimov. Ibrahimov is also a decent wrestler. He's got a Sambo background, but I mean, Dolis has just kind of proven that he's a very strong guy as well, and Grappling's kind of his own his own powerhouse. So there's, di- there's different ways of looking at it. Brett Johns could spring the upset. It would be a moderate score. $7,100 is a great price. It would be a moderate score. Askarov could spring the upset. And he scored 73 points against Tim Elliott. Mm-hmm. And he's $7,400 here. So again, it would be it would be a mid-level score for you. Whereas Ibrahimov, at least if this motherfucker wins, the upside, the, the upside is like a hundred points. Yeah, that. over a hundred points from a seventy-three. Like based on yeah, based on just his strike output from his previous two fights. If he manages to get a win, which is a decent if, you know, he's a plus one sixty underdog as it stands right now. Yeah, he is the guy with the highest upside down there. And I only, I don't really play cash games, Cody. I just play uh, my new, my new. My new love is uh, just the single entries. I just play a bunch of single entry. As many single entries as they will throw out there, I just kind of keep adding more single entry. Because, and yeah, I'll throw it into the uh, to the to the big boy. I'll throw the one lineup into the you know one hundred and fifty thousand to first type of contest. But I don't expect to win that when I'm going up against other people with one hundred and fifty lineups. Of course. Um, I mean, sometimes sometimes a few a few of our fans or whatever single bullets. Um, for 66k, the uh, you know just a week ago, sometimes I get some plays out. That's why it's the fear of missing out when I throw in that lineup. But for the most part, I'm just playing single entry, and uh, yeah, I'm probably gonna end up playing Ibragimov and and really le- and, and really regretting it. But eh, fair, you know, fair. you you, I'll, you, I'll, you I'll can't be too thing. comfortable. No, no, and I'll give you one thing: if you're playing DK, you're playing that big GPP, you're trying to take out the big one. Kat is versus Da Ung Jung. Remember you said earlier, 88 significant strikes landed in that fight. You know, he landed some strikes. He landed 60 in the first round yeah. and then gassed out. I want a guy who throws six, lands. I shouldn't say throw. He threw 111 strikes. Let's go. In the, in the first fucking round. That's the guy. And gassed out. Yeah, yo, that's, that's, that's the guy. That's quite literally who you're looking to get because – Listen, first round, he no, lost his last yeah. two. He's lost his last two. You know what that means? Matter of time before he gets somebody. He's due. 
No, nah, it doesn't exactly, actually. Exactly, man. It doesn't exactly. Like that, you're going to lose some, you're going to win some, but you are going to win some. Yeah, at least he throws. At least he throws, and that's all I'm really asking for. It gets really, I mean, it usually gets pretty ugly. There's no underdogs, like, deep down the board that I'm, like, in love with. So he looks, he looks like the guy. He looks like the guy. All right, before we get out of here, hit him with the PRP. Okay, so we're a little short on dogs this week, but we're going to go with Davidson Figueredo, favorite. Jack Hermanson, he's even, so you can't really consider him either there. DKC, favorite. Luana Carolina is technically the underdog again. Not, It's just plus 100. Uh, I'm going to take Pantoja reluctantly as of now. Bad price. I'm going to look a little more into that. You know what? I'm going to take a Brogamov. This price is a little off. At least hasn't fought in a while. He's not in his juice. He's plus 160. Like you said, he's banger bust, but I need a little bit dog. Dawson's going to be my other favorite. I am going to take Joe Duffy. That's an awful price tag. I just don't trust him. I would look to avoid. Listen, it might not be a bad price tag. Like you said, it might get to 500. But deep down inside of me, it's like, let him win a fight, Cody, and then bid him the next time out. You just don't know what you're getting into. He's had a little bit of mental setbacks in the past. Montel Jackson, another favorite. Miro Bazi, another favorite. Chizurukian, another favorite. So it's like, oh, all right, let's cap her off with a dog. First card, fight on the card. We'll take that dog money on Carlos Felipe. So, I mean, technically speaking, we got Felipe. He hasn't fought in three years, and he was a juicer, is our dog. And we're going to take a Bragamov, who is fighting a juicer, who hasn't fought in a year. That's like, there's a lot of potential apple pie shit oh, happening yeah. around here. Uh, and then and then our other fights are even money, essentially, Jack Hermanson. And you're against that. So I'm going to obviously take that into consideration. And then uh, Luana Carolina. I, Lipsky is the better striker. Just think she'll have the volume. So this is a dicey card. It's not exactly one with a ton of spots to make money. If I'm looking for my most confident guys, Figueredo, just based on the, how the last fight goes, even without the knock of the headbutt, he still gets it. 210, that's something I'm confident. Dia Casey, 155, I really don't mind that price tag at all. Uh, Grant Dawson, 255, you know, you're going to parlay that with some stuff. Probably pretty good. Amir al again, I've looked at as many fights as I can as I can from him, and I, I really don't want to ba- bet him on the basis of fading Gordon but I'm probably going to have a decent amount of shares of him at 165. in 200, I think that's a great price tag. The rest of it's pretty much passable, but obviously guys like having dogs, so that's why we've sprinkled a couple in the mix. But uh, listen, try to be safe this weekend. Don't go as big as you can. Uh, if you did, though, you know, there's some spots to make money. And uh, regardless, yeah, hopefully we help. Hopefully you enjoy the show. Feel free to hit me up on Twitter. And uh, let's get through this one, boys. Let's get back on board. So, uh, yeah, hope you... Uh... Yeah, any final thoughts there, Cody, before I uh, get out of here? No, I pretty much just wrapped it up. I mean, it's been a crazy week considering we had a, the fight on Wednesday and then Top Rank runs those Tuesdays and Thursdays show, so I've been kind of half and watching the fight. Clay Collard! My eye. Clay Collard! Yeah, Corona! Yeah, he's uh, plus 145 inside the distance. Co- COVID, the COVID killer. The guy, that's a, the guy's become a real star in the boxing world. Good for him, because... They had no business ever cutting Clay Collard. The guy was an exciting fighter, just showed up to go to war every single... Like, he's... When you see guys like Diego Sanchez and, like, he... Clay Collard could have been one of those guys. Just an action fighter that the fans love. They just never got behind him. They didn't know what they had. Good thing the top rank has has the guy. And his hands are look... Like, he looks really awkward, but, man, he's... It's effective, whatever the hell he's doing. You know, Timothy Bradley does the he does the play by play. Like he's one of the announcers on the on the top ranked team. He he actually said it the best. He actually nailed it hundred percent. He's like, How do you prepare for this? Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, how, how do you prepare for this? Because you're in a gym with boxers, and I can assure you they don't do that. No. So you're trying to get guys in camp that do it. It's just like, man, well, well, bring in some tough Mexican guys that are just gonna move forward and throw a lot of punches. It's like, man, he throws awkward angles and the way he like he'll drop his hands and bait you and then come back and here's the sneakiest part that's why you got plus money on that uh, inside the distance on Tuesday was um he only showed like two knockout wins and seven fights or something but it's like man he's fighting six round fights against good guys so mm-hmm. it's like the finish doesn't always materialize that Kaminsky kid his last time out he busted both of his eardrums and put him in the hospital so like fight went the distance but it's like he straight up kicked his ass now you're gonna give him a fellow MMA fighter from South Africa who's got, I don't know, that writing was on the wall for a good Clay Collard win there. But the fact that they gave him an easy fight like that after fighting four murders in a row, finally he's the A-side. Finally they're promoting him. Finally you'll start seeing this guy make some decent paydays. It looks like he's uh, very entertaining. So the UFC actually did him a massive, massive, massive favorite. 
So they signed him. He was going to fight Devontae Smith, remember? Yep. And then I don't know if he I don't know if he got hurt. I don't know if he missed he was going to miss weight, so he let them know. But he pulled out and they were really mad and they cut him. But prior to him signing with the UFC for the Devontae Smith fight, this is his last boxing match. He says, This is my last boxing match. I'm retiring. I'm going to focus back on MMA. And when Dana was like, Nope, screw you, you know, you you pulled out of this fight that you were supposed to do it as a favor, pulling in short notice, and they pulled away the contract, he had no other option. He just went back to boxing. Best thing that could have happened to him. Yeah, good for Clay. Good for Clay. Any- yeah, for sure. Good, good for him. Anyway, that's it for us for this week. Hope you enjoyed the show. For Cody Saptic, I'm Paul Shaughnessy saying goodbye and good luck. Batman on Experience! It's the Batman on Experience! <laughs>